Hi, it's Kernatex here, and in this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to build, what, how to install, build, and maintain Gen 2 Linux. Now, Gen 2 is the natural choice um, to move on to from Linux from scratch, in that it's a distribution that is built from source. But the big advantage it has over Linux from scratch is that the build process is almost fully automated. Um, now, th the reason why it's it's that different is more or less down to the purposes of the two distributions. Um, Linux from scratch is primarily an educational tool, although you can, as we've seen in my other videos, build a working system that can be used um, day to day. The big problem with Linux from scratch is that it's as it stands it's difficult to um, update and maintain packages especially some of the core packages such as the um, C library, glibc. Um, certain other packages have been designed or installed in such a way that they are easier to updates such as um, Xorg and uh, LibreOffice for example. So Gen2 is, as I already said, it's, in, it's a distribution that's compiled from source um, but the automation makes it possible to use um, as a, um, a distribution you can use for, from day to day and still maintain it with security updates and updates that are um, coming so it, it makes it a lot lot easier a lot more sensible to use as a, as a real system rather than Linux from scratch having said that I, I have used Linux from scratch for almost 10 years um, and what I used to do is update packages where I could for example KDE, Java etc, uh, OpenOffice as it was then um, and then I would update the base system, the actual Linux from scratch system, um, every year or two. But as you've seen, it's very onerous, it's very manual, it takes a lot of time. Um, as you'll see in this video, Gen 2 requires a minimal amount of manual effort. Um, most of the effort is in the initial setup and configuration. And even then, a lot of the work has already been done. There's only a handful of... Um, configuration files and settings that actually need to be manipulated. Uh, most of the rest of it is done. Um, Gen2 has a package manager that is unique to Gen2 called Portage. Um, it's extremely powerful and quite often I see when people write about it that they say it's the probably about the best package manager out there. Um, I've not used many other package managers apart from apt um, RPM a long time ago. Um, I think that's about it actually, come to think of it. So I've only, I've only used a few, but it's certainly the best out of all of those ones. So I would concur with, with what I've read. It's um, extremely powerful. There's a suite of commands that are used to um, maintain the system. Um, there's one to pull in the updates, um, there's another one to um, actually start the compilation process going and so on, um, there's one to query the database, uh, but I'll, I'll show you some of those, there's obviously a lot of information on the in internet, um, on the Gen2 website about that and how to use it, uh, extremely comprehensive um, documentation and, and, and the tool itself is uh, extremely comprehensive. So what I'm going to do is start as I did before with a um, new virtual machine. Again, as before, um, it's quite possible to um, build this uh, on a physical machine, um, but for this demonstration I will build it in a virtual virtual machine um, just so it's easy to play around with it. Um, 
by, by all means, again, you can use a physical machine. The process shouldn't be a great deal different. I suppose the only concern is what, what the um, media is that you boot the machine from initially um, to, to start the install process, it, whether it's a, a CD drive, a USB stick, or, or by some other means. Um, but for, for this demonstration, I will be just using a, a, a disk image a CD image which um, comes from the Gen 2. So what I should do first is start off with um, creating a, a new machine uh, and ba basically it will be the same as it was for the Linux from scratch but I'll just create a new machine. I'm going to make one or two slight changes um, in that I'm going to give it 16 gig of memory and I'm going to up the number of cores to six, even though I'll get a warning about that because I've only got eight cores on the machine and VirtualBox will warn you if you go over half that number. Um, I'm going to see what it, how it goes and hopefully the uh, compilation will go a little bit faster than it did uh, for Linux from scratch. Um, that That is also the reason why, I've, why I'm giving the virtual machine more memory is because I'm upping the cores. Um, another reason is it's it's easy, and it will happen anyway, it's easy to make changes and tweaks that affect quite a number of packages, so you'll find that you want to adjust one little, one little item of the installation and it touches quite a few other packages, so you'll find that um, you may find that uh, 10 or 20 packages may need to be reinstalled just because of one little tweak that you make. Um, but this, this, it sounds like a bad thing, but it's not really because that's where the true power of Gen 2 lies. You, you might decide that you want to compile in, for example, um, I don't know, JPEG support. You turn on that JPEG flag and there's so many packages that um, are capable of dealing with JPEGs that all those packages need to be built. And conversely, you may find that you want JPEG uh, functionality everywhere except for one or two different packages for example so you can individually turn off the support for just those two packages but leave it um, um, available for support in other packages so let's start by building the virtual machine I'm going to call it Gen 2 um, and it's uh, obviously a Linux type of uh, operating system and in, under the version just pick Gen 2 64 bit if we click on next, uh, so I'm going to make this uh, have 16 megabytes. So I'll just click on that little handle, the little circle, and move this up to 16384, which is 16 gigabytes. And I want to create a new hard disk, brand new hard disk. So again, this is assuming you've got a fresh hard disk if you're building this on a um, physical machine it would expect that we have a hard disk that is wiped clean or, or it's brand new for example with no, no data existing on the hard disk no partition information or anything so I'll click create there we'll take the default VDI type click next what I've dynamically allocated so it makes best use of the available space on the on the real machine on the host machine and then it wants a size, so again I'm going to create 64 gigs, should be more than enough. I think the um, size of the disk uh, when everything that I'm going to demonstrate is installed is about 32, 33, 34 gigabytes. So we'll give it 64, there's plenty of room for temporary files and so on. And if you remember from Linux from scratch, if you've seen those videos, um, certain packages are quite big, you know, there's one, I, th I can't remember which one it was now, it was something like 12, 13 gigabytes um, of files that was created while the compilation was uh, being processed. So, always have plenty of space with um, when you're compiling. So let's create that, let's done that. And we'll go into settings and just make a few adjustments here now. So there's nothing to be done in general. In system, we've got 16 gig of memory. We don't want a floppy disk, so we can move that out of the way. We'll make the hard disk the first bootable item. As before, it's blank, so the way the BIOS will work, the virtual BIOS is it will see there's nothing on there, so it'll just move to the next 
um, piece of hardware that it can boot from and see if it can boot from that and that will be the optical disc where we will have um, an, an image that is bootable chipset let's make that more recent ICH9 pointing devices PS2 and we'll leave all the other settings under processor we want to give this I want to give this six processors obviously depending on how many processors you have available you may want to adjust that almost certainly don't want to go to maximum you won't give the host operating system a chance to do anything so I would say you know what I've done here three quarters is probably about the absolute maximum and I would expect that that's gonna probably slow down the recorder I've got going as well so <laughs> I'm hoping it won't cause too many problems um, we'll enable PAE and NX acceleration no I don't need to touch anything there um, display I don't think we need to change anything here um, yeah this is all changing this latest version of uh, VirtualBox I'm tempted to put that on VBox SVGA and turn on 3D acceleration might have to change this if I have problems with the um, uh, full screen later on when we've got the GUI up and running but we'll leave that as, uh, we'll put it into VBOX SVGA, sounds like a good one. Uh, storage, right, so we don't want an IDE controller, so we'll get rid of that. And we've got our disk that's already been attached, and it's on port zero, so we now want to attach um, an optical drive. So you can, or you can either right, uh, click that icon there, or click this one here, and just click add optical drive. I'm going to choose a disk and we're going to add in um, right okay maybe I should show you actually uh, yeah what I need to do is add in a file I've already downloaded which is that one there so maybe I should next of all show you where to get that file from so if we go to Gen 2 handbook in the browser the first link that comes up hand, handbook main page is the one you want and then along the top here you need to select the um, the um, like CPU if you like the uh, hardware that you're using so if you're 64-bit you want to choose a 64-bit Intel or AMD you want to choose AMD 64 if you're running on 32-bit Intel or AMD you want to be on x86 don't select the IA64 that's for a different type of uh, technology that Intel produce mainly for servers so we're going to do 64-bit click on that and this is the start of the um, Gen 2 handbook for installing now split up into several sections we'll only be going through in this video the first section the installing Gen 2 bit but I thoroughly recommend before after the video when you go to you know if you decide to carry on using it and want to learn more about Gen 2 I thoroughly recommend reading all of the remaining parts of this handbook um, extremely useful especially um, this working with Gen 2 bit and the working with portar Portage bit as well. Um, very, very highly recommended reading to, to get to know Gen 2 a lot, lot better. So if we start on the first link about the Gen 2 installation, um, it describes Gen 2, the fact that, again, it's built from source, so in theory it should be the fastest for the machine you build it on because it, it will be customised and... Um, uh, configured for the hardware you're you're compiling on in a similar way that um, LFS would do and then it lists as 10 sections of this part of the handbook which is the installation part um, and there's also some uh, links here for if you don't install from a, a Gen 2 CD which is perfectly possible in fact I was thinking about doing this video demonstration um, using the Linux from scratch 
that we'd built previously as the source uh, package to boot from, but I decided against it as it would have been deviating from this standard handbook slightly. It it, it worked, but um, there was a couple of places where to do things slightly differently. So I decided against that and just go with the standard uh, standard book. And there's also another link there for some installation tips and tricks. So I'll leave that to, for you to, to read if you so wish. And also there's bits here about where to go for help if you have trouble with installation. Um, you can ask me questions on the comments. I'll do my best to answer, but uh, primarily I, I won't be able to do that. I'm not a Gen 2 expert. Um, I, I'm only a gen, interested in Gen 2 in that I've, I've been using it for... Um, or probably getting on for 10 years or so now um, and that's all I do I'm, I'm an end user I'm not a developer or you know, I don't submit anything to to, to the uh, Gen 2 foundation itself um, but yeah they've got facts and uh, there's Gen 2 forums with a very helpful very busy forums so I'm sure if you put your questions up there you'll, you'll get a reply fairly quickly so we move on to choosing the right installation medium. Um, we've got some hardware requirements here, so you can see what, because we're on the AMD handbook, it tells you what type of CPU you should be using, um, how much memory is required, uh, disk space required, and that's for the absolute minimum installation. That's I mentioned before we'll need about 30 gig, but that's because we're going to be installing some of the packages that I installed in Linux from scratch. Um, just as a demonstration of how, how well, yeah, I suppose what the differences are that the end result will be the same, or very very similar, but the um, the way they're installed and how they're configured and how you pull in extra functionalities are different, and that's that's the biggest part or the biggest difference between Gen two and Linux from scratch, and some swap space at least two five six meg. You can see that if you boot, there's two. Uh, Gen 2 discs they do is the live CD which is the uh, or DVD rather which is the DVD that I use to um, boot from at the start of the Linux from scratch uh, installation um, as you saw that's quite up to date now it's 2016 I believe it's uh, it was um, built last built um, June or July 2016 so it's, it's nearly three years old now that's not a problem because the way Gen 2 is built, the core system's downloaded as a tarball, so it's not reliant as we were with Linux from scratch on the versions of the uh, compile tools such as Make or the li uh, C library or or the kernel version. It's just purely used to, um, to to get a working system on on this new system we're creating that hasn't got anything on it at all at, at the outset. So I've always installed Gen 2 using the Linux DVD or Linux DVD sorry the live DVD um, but I'm gonna go for a slight change and go for the minimal CD something I've never done before so I'm hoping I'm not gonna get tripped up um, but it's basically as it's a smaller image as, as it suggests it's a small image that fits on the on this uh, CD I think it's about half a CD's worth two or three hundred megabytes rather than the DVD which is about I think two or three gigabytes in size, so it's a lot smaller. It means you can put it on a smaller system with you know less memory or so on. So um, yeah, they mentioned the live DVD here. Occasionally they produce it. I haven't produced it as I say for three years. So uh, they tend to produce it on certain occasions. I've noticed if you look back at the history of when they have produced the live DVDs, it's been. You know, for example, on the 10th anniversary of Gen 2, one was produced, and there's an end of the world edition that was produced in December 2012 when uh, certain people thought the world was going to end, and so on. It's just a you know, they're poking fun, a little bit of light fun at people. So, um, what what the next one or when the next one will be, I don't know. But um, as I say, if you wish to use use that, if you've already got it burnt on, on um, a DVD or you've already got the image somewhere, if you're using the um, virtual box yeah, quite quite okay to to use that instead but as I say I'll be using the minimal um, j just just to just for a change I've never done it before 
So it says obtaining the media, um, and here it says the CD images themselves can be downloaded from downloads page or manually, which is recommended, or manually browsing the ISO location, one of the many available mirrors. So if we go to the downloads page, as that's recommended, let's see what comes up there. So it's got here AMD 64, so it's got the 64 bit and the 32 bit. So we want the 64 bit and we're going to go for the minimal installation so you can see it's just under 300 megabytes as opposed to 2 gigabytes for the hybrid ISO. We'll also need this stage 3 archive but we won't need that until we're actually inside the virtual machine when we've got the virtual machine up and running so we won't download download that now because it will just end up on the host machine and, and that's in the wrong place. Um, if you are building 32-bit of it's interesting, I've just noticed this says i686 here. They used to produce um, stage 3 for 486. Now whether that's actually on the um, on the server, if you actually browse manually, I don't know um, if you're intending to build for an old machine. I've never built Gen 2 on a machine any older than the Pentium Pro, which is you know over 20 years old now, I would have thought. Um, Linux from scratch I've built on 386s and 486s and Pentiums um, but <laughs> there, there are limits now you can't build a modern Linux on, on a 386 anymore you can still build it on a 486 um, although that, that may may stop within you know in the coming months or years because it's extremely old technology that's uh, probably 30 years old I would have thought a, a 486 but um Linux from scratch is quite good on old hardware because it is just basic stuff you're you're building if you're building a basic server and it's it's also good learning because it, it compiles slowly you can see things a little bit more because it doesn't go whizzing off the screen so fast but um, I digress um, but yeah if you are interested in building on a uh, a system that's an old system you know, like a Pentium or a 486 and you wanted to do Gen 2 well be prepared for long a long wait while things are built but also, as I say, I don't know if it would be possible or not, being as I haven't got a uh, a four eight six link here anymore. It may, as I say, may be be there. It's just not on this web page, but it may may still be on the server. In which case, you'd have to use this other link, the available mirrors link. Um, in fact, let's do that now. We'll see if if there is anything there. Uh, so I want to go to the UK as the nearest. I always go to the Mirror service. So releases. Uh, it will be under the x86 because it'll be 32 bit only. Auto builds. Yeah, they have. Oh, yeah, they've got a stage three. There under the 486. So yes, they are still producing it. They're just not advertising it on their web page. So as I say, if you're interested in producing on a 486 or a Pentium. Uh, or Pentium MMX, then, uh, or even one of the chips that are around at the time, like the Cyrix or the IBM or the Thompson clones, then uh, these are the files you'd have to go for, these ones here, to enable that to work. I've, as I say, I've never built on a 486. If you are interested in doing it, I have read when I've looked at it that there are some little tweaks you may need to do to actually get this to work. So... I probably wouldn't recommend doing this if this is your first time with Gen 2. I'd, I'd just do the normal 32-bit or 64-bit installation, get to know it a little bit better before you uh, uh, delve into this sort of more esoteric stuff. So let's go back to this. So all you need to do is download. Let's click on that, and it's downloading. So I've already actually downloaded this, as you might have seen on the virtual box um, so I'll stop this there's no point in I'll cancel right so will that have deleted it yeah it looks like it has done um, so this is where I'm attaching it to the um, optical disk and I need to Add it in. Is that the one there? Yeah, minimal. Yeah, it hasn't been attached. That's right. So it's it's. I've just added it by clicking add, selecting that file there, and it's it's now 
uh, VirtualBox is now aware of that ISO, but it's not attached to any machine. So all I need to do is just select that and choose it, and it's added it to that um, CD drive that we created on, on that SATA controller. So, so we've got the hard disk on port zero and the optical drive with that uh, with that CD minimal CD image on on port one. And as I say, because the hard drive is brand new, when it boots, as before with Linux from scratch, it will skip past that and just boot that. But as soon as we get a bootable disk, it will boot from the disk because that's got the priority, and it will just ignore the um, it'll ignore booting from the optical disk. Audio as before, I'll just set that to yeah, it's already set to AC ninety seven. Let's say because. Um, it's in a virtual machine. I've got headphones on while I'm recording this. If there were any sound, you wouldn't hear it anyway because it will be in my ears only. Um, but that's that's not too much of a concern, really. It's not really the purpose. The purpose is to show the installation of, of this system and things like sound and USB and so on are sort of uh, by the way kind of things. So network, again, uh, I'm going to be using fixed IPs. Um, you'll want to leave it at that if you want to use DHCP, but um, probably wouldn't recommend that. It's it's simpler, I think, to um, use fixed IPs, and certainly the uh, the manual demonstrates how to set up fixed IPs. But if you wish to use DHCPs, then don't follow what I do. Just just follow what the manual says for setting up DHCP. Um, serial ports, don't want any of them. USB, I'm not going to enable that. Um, don't need that and that should be it so I've got warning down here and that's about the fact that I've assigned more than half the number of uh, CPUs or cores that are available on the host machine to this virtual machine I have I've selected six but I'm going to ignore that and hope that it's not going to cause a problem so as a quick resume I have everything there with the machine so now I'm going to start the machine up. Let's get rid of that. We don't need that anymore. Let's just follow this. Yeah, if that's a point that's worth mentioning. If you want to check the digest of the ISO file when you download it, then there's some information here on how to do that. But um, I'm not going to show you how to do that. Just trust it. it. Tells you there about how to burn a disk. There's a fact there if you want to burn it to a real disk to boot um, a real physical machine with, how to burn it on uh, Windows and so on. And then how to boot it. Now, in the virtual machine, we don't need to worry about any of these settings. It will just work as it is. But obviously on a physical machine, there's so many different varieties and flavors and so on. You may need to read this to find out if you're having problems booting. Um, some of these settings you may need to add to um, enable them, the uh, CD to boot correctly. I'll say in the virtual machine it won't work. I doubt very much, in fact, if it's a pretty modern machine, you know, within the last two, three years, maybe even four or five years, that you'd need any of these anyway. These I've found um, they tend to be more uh, required for older machines, so hopefully you won't come across any problems. Um, again, if there's hardware you need working, it, it describes here what you need to do to get that hardware working by um, activating modules in the kernel by using Mod Pro. But um, I'm not going to discuss that here again in, in the virtual machine. Uh, it's not required. And that's another reason why I'm demonstrating this on a virtual machine is because it makes the demonstration a lot simpler. I don't have to worry about... Um, these little idiosyncrasies which would sort of divert from the actual point of the video which is to get Gen 2 installed. Now it mentions here about getting a user account added if somebody wants to use a machine. I kind of don't really understand this because it's a new machine that you're installing why would you need user accounts at this point so I'm not quite sure about that unless I suppose you know, somebody needs access to the machine remotely for some reason while you're installing, I don't know, but it, I kind of see that a little bit pointless. Um, it tells you how to view the documentation while you're in the virtual machine. 
Um, I won't be doing that. I'll be doing what I did with Linux from scratch, be accessing the um, new machine remotely with um, uh, an SSH session. Um, <clears throat> and once we've got a GUI and a browser installed, then I'll be doing everything from within, within the um, new virtual machine. So, but if, if you wish to, you, you can use links and use a utility called GPM, which allows you to copy and paste text. Um, you could do that. Um, yeah, I'm tempted to do that, but I don't think I will. <laughs> uh, it's it's a little bit harder to do if you're not used to um, browsing, A, using a text browser, and B, copying and pasting text within a you know a console basically a, a text console it's a little bit harder to do so I will stick to the GUI stuff as uh, more more people are, uh, are used to that and we'll have to do this we'll have to start an SSH daemon so that we can access the new machine externally from the host so let's get this booted okay so there's the boot screen now what I'll do is I'll just type something in there to stop it booting automatically I'm going to make this bigger just so it's easy to see so this boot prompt is where you would put in some of these options if you needed any so um, you can get F1 will show you the kernel so you do something like Gen 2 and then one of the options, for example, uh, slow, uh, no USB, for example. So you type that in, and that that would boot that Gen 2 kernel with the no USB option. There's also a mem test here. That's worth. Oh, I can't click and highlight. Sorry. Um, that's worth running to check your memory. Although in my experience, um, I've had machines fail when they've been compiling, and when I've done mem test it's not found anything wrong with the memory um, and yet the type of error that comes up when you're compiling indicates a memory fault and I've changed the memory and it has actually been a memory fault so while mem test is a good general memory tester there's nothing like a good compile that will will eke out any memory memory errors uh, basically I'm saying mem test is is not foolproof whereas in my opinion com compiling stuff especially some of the bigger packages like uh, glib or gcc or even the kernel they do really weed out any any problems with the memory um, including cache memory on the chip i've had cache memory fail on the chip before um, and when i've turned it off in the bios the, the errors have gone away uh, and mem test wouldn't find that because it only checks main memory as far as i'm aware um, but yeah, and also the no FB one is for no frame buffers if you're getting problems with the um, uh, video screen when you're booting, if it's not there or if it's coming up with garble or just a mess, uh, then try the Gen 2 no FB kernel. But I say the um, uh, virtual machine doesn't have any problems. Um, yeah, I've just pressed F2 there and it it shows you all these options there and it gives you a good description as well just in case you haven't got the handbook to hand so so we just press enter here just to get the machine booting okay so it's gone to quite a big screen size now after all that so it's waiting for a keyboard input at the moment so I'm going to choose 40 uh, for a UK keyboard and I'm going to reduce this back down again actually Right, I'm not sure if it took that or not because I didn't press enter in time. So I'm just going to reduce this to 125. And what I should do is I'm going to reboot again and do that again just so you can see how it should have been. So, okay, so we're rebooting from scratch again. There's the prompt. Just press enter or wait for it and it'll boot. Uh, so you've got to pick your keyboard, but as you saw, you've got to pick quite quickly. So I'm going to do 40 and press enter. 
just so that the keys work correctly on my UK keyboard. And hopefully this is clear. It's uh, still quite tiny, the writing, but um, and it's also a little bit fuzzy on the screen, but hopefully it'll come across on the video okay. And while I'm at it, I'll uh, increase the resolution of this browser as well, just in case that's a bit tiny. <coughs> Um, just in case you've never seen these penguins before, they're called Tux, it's the Linux logo. Um, or is it the Linux one? I'm not sure if it's the Linux or GNU or GNU Linux logo, but it's the one that's most associated with Linux. Uh, his name's Tux, and there's six of them there, and you get one each of them for the number of cores that are available. So the fact that I've got six just shows that this virtual machine has got four cores. So obviously if you've got four, uh, sorry, six cores, if you've got four cores running, you will only see four penguins, four tuxes and so on. So here we are, we've booted up. Um, we've got a, a perfectly usable system, quite good for uh, using as a rescue disc um, in the same way that the DVD is. So the only thing I'm gonna do here at the moment is, well there's two things actually, I'm going to change the password of the root by using, using PAASSWD password and I'm going to change that to something simple and the reason is because I've, this is the only user at the moment and we've got to log in to this machine so we'll log in as the root because we're going to spend most of the time as the root user initially and the next thing I'm going to do is to start up the secure shell service, the SSHD service. Just so, okay, yeah, I can't copy and paste. No, I'm going to type that in by hand. Which is why I'm getting this service running so I can access this machine from my host machine. So let's type RC service. SSHD start. Okay, generate some keys and it starts. And the next thing we need to know is what the IP address is. Uh, IF config. So there's the network interface. Sorry, I can't highlight again. And as you'll notice, that's the well, as you'd expect. Even that is the same hardware interface name as we had on the Linux from scratch and the bit I'm interested in is because this has used DHCP I don't know what IP address it's picked up um, and I don't even know if it would use the host name when I try to connect to it but I can't go wrong if I know the IP address so you can see it's 192.168.0.78 so that's that's what I need to know to gain access to this box so now I'm going to get up a uh, terminal and I'm going to secure shell into this virtual machine now so I've got to do it as root so I need to specify the username and the IP address 192.168.0.78 and it's warning me that it can't authenticate the fingerprint which is the fingerprint that was just created when we started the server up for the first time you sure you want to connect? Yes, I'm sure because we've just created this machine on this IP address, so it can't be anything but that one. Type the password in I just created, and you can see we're now in, and there's a little welcome there saying we're on the minimal installation CD, so we know we're into the right machine now. And this message will be the same message as the one that's back here when we logged in. And you'll notice the penguins have gone now because I've just uh, gone back in the in the terminal history. So we can now move on configuring the network. Well, the network must be working because we just uh, entered the virtual machine via SSH. And again, we can confirm that by typing in ifconfig, and it's exactly the same information that we just saw. So we can skip all of this. Obviously, if you're installing on a physical machine, then this is going to be quite important. The 
CD, well, uh, the minimal CD, I'm assuming it's the same as the live DVD. It's pretty good at picking up, you know, standard like Intel type and um, is it RT Link? I think is another big brand of uh, manufacturer of network cards. It, it's pretty good at picking up all the big ones, but if you do get problems, then there's a whole section there on configuring the network and getting it working. Um, actually, this bit at the bottom is worth checking just to make sure we can resolve uh, names on the network. So let's do a quick cat of that. And yeah, it's picked up two name servers for me, my local one and an external one. So that's that's fine. So in theory, we should be able to do something like ping www.gen2.org and that's working, so that's fine. So now we go on to first bit about preparing the disks and it gives you good information about um, block devices and disks, partition tables and so on. Um, and then it describes the difference between the GPT partition layout and the MBR. I'm going to be sticking with the MBR as it's simpler. Um, I may in the future, I've, I've got plans on redoing the Linux from scratch when they update it next in October. And I may even do Gen 2 again, um, maybe in another half year or year or so. Uh, but my plan is to do this on a real machine and have a camera pointing at the screen. Uh, to show how similar it is, but also to show some of the little problems you might get, say, with hardware. So um, at that point, I think I'd probably do it on a modern machine and actually do the GPT uh, layout. Um, but for this demonstration, just to get the Gen 2 up and running, although we could use GPT and UEFI, um, I'm just going to stick with the basic stuff at the moment. Um, but obviously these these new systems, G, the GPT layout, are uh, becoming more and more popular, although they've been around for quite a while now. They're, they haven't been as popular as uh, they have been more recently. Um, so the layout of the disk, it's going to be similar to the one in Linux from scratch video. Uh, the only difference is I'm going to create a separate boot partition, uh, and that's purely for a security reason, and that's security not only in the sense of um, outside influences security, for example, being hacked, um, but more it's more to do with security of protecting you from your, yourself. Um, by having a separate boot partition, you can elect to not have it mounted automatically. So it means that that, that partition, which is the partition that's absolutely key to getting the machine up and running, or at least in, in a, a very basic state, um, it's protected because it's not mounted. So if things get deleted or changed by accident, something rogue goes over your disk, in theory, because it's not mounted, um, there's less chance of any corruption or anything interfering with the kernel and uh, the actual boot, boot partition, um, which means that you've got a chance of, of actually getting a system, a very basic system up and running to go and repair the rest of the machine. Um, so that's one difference of what we'll be doing in the, uh, in the partition layout. Uh, apart from that, it will be similar. So I'll be doing a boot partition. I'll be creating a swap partition and I'll be creating a main root partition, if you like. So let's start by using F disk. I'm not going to, oops, I'm not going to follow this to the letter. There's a lot of information here about different ways of creating and uh, how to create different partitions, different systems, RAID systems, LVM. That's all for you to read if you're interested in that. I'm just going to be creating, um, let's just say, just a plain system. There's so many options here. Uh, you know, it'll take forever to to go through each permutation if you like, and um, even down to what what program you use to create the partitions. Do you use F disk? Do you use Parted? And there's there's a few others. Uh, so yeah, this this bit here says you about using as an alternate to use F disk. So that's the way I'm going to use. But I'm not going to use their layout exactly. 
So I'm just going to skip through this um, down to here, creating file systems. So let's let's create the partitions. So we should, if we do minus L, F disk minus L, that'll list all the disks we've got on the system. And as before, with the Linux from scratch, when we boot from the live DVD, we've got these other these other RAM disks which we ignore. The one we're interested in, which is the physically, sorry, virtual disk in this case that we've created where the system is going to go is this dev SDA. As you can see, it's 64 gigabytes, which is what we specified. And there's a little hint there, VBox hard disk is the disk model. So that's the one we want to use. And this is a good way of being safe by highlighting and, and pasting um, the name of that that device, that block device, rather than typing in, because if you were to do that, and you had a an SDB, another disk, you could start do, altering that disk without realising it, and not not wanting to touch that one at all. So it's it's always a good idea to copy and paste. And as before, uh, with the Linux from scratch video, I showed how left click and hold to highlight, and then centre click, normally the mouse wheel will paste what's highlighted. There's no right clicking and copying or anything like that uh, in Linux. It's, it's that simple. So fdisk space forward slash dev forward slash SDA. And we go into the fdisk utility. You can do P to print what's currently on there. And as you can expect, it's empty. So it's just showing us some information that we've already seen. Because it's uh, we're now running um, F disk and it's identified it as a brand new disk. It's already assumed that we want a disk label, sorry, a disk type uh, of DOS, and it's created a identifier for it as well automatically. So first thing we'll do is type N for a new partition. We want to take the default P for primary. Default partition number one. Press press enter. First sector again the default two four eight. And the last sector, well, I don't know what the last sector is, but I know how big I want this boot partition to be. And I want it to be 128 megabytes. So to do that, we type in a plus 128 and a capital M. So that means give me a 128 megabyte partition and press enter. And it tells us there it's created a new partition one of type Linux and of size 128 megabytes. So if we now do P to print the partition table, you can see it's calculated what the end partition to be, should be based on the number of sectors which translates into that size and basically 128 megabytes divided by 512 bytes is that many sectors and then if you add that many sectors to the start number of sectors it should come out of that more or less it'd be one less because the first sector is used as, as part of those uh, 262,000 sectors. So that's the boot partition. Now we need to create a swap partition. So new primary. Now swap, loads of stories about how big you should create swap partitions and so on. Um, might be worth creating one the same size as the memory because you've then got the option of enabling Hibernate on your machine and Hibernate will use the swap partition, so it's quite efficient. It's not like Windows where you have a separate swap file and a separate uh, Hibernate file. Linux uses, because you don't need a swap file when you're hibernating and vice versa, um, it's it's sensible to, to reuse something rather than having to allocate more disk space for something else. So... I've got a 16 gigabyte uh, virtual machine here, so I'm going to create a 16 gigabyte um, partition for the swap. So partition number default again, next one is two. First sector can take the default. Last sector is going to be 16 plus 16 gigabytes. I don't know what the last sector is, but I'm going to tell the system to give me uh, 16 gigabytes as the size of partition. If I print that up now, so there we've got a 16 gigabyte swap size. And again, 16 gigabyte is probably way too much for a real swap file, but if you want to use 
uh, hibernation, then it's got to be at least the size of the memory that we've got. Lastly, we need to create a root partition where the rest of the system goes basically. So do n again, accept the default p primary, accept the default again, which is the next available partition, accept the first sector, and then we want to use the rest of the disk, so just accept the last sector. And you see it's created one that's just below 48 gigabytes, which is about right considering we've created a 64 gig partition uh, disk. So last we do P for print. You can see there's the three partitions. We've got um, 128 meg for the uh, boot uh, partition, uh, yeah, boot partition, 16 gig swap, and 48 gig for the main root partition. The only thing left to do before we write this to disk is to change that type to swap just so we know what it's used for. So to do that you do T and press enter. Select the partition number which is partition number 2. There it is there. Um, if you don't know what the codes are you can do L to list them and if you look at number 82 there's one there for Linux swap. So that's the code we type in. And it says it's changed it from Linux to Linux swap. And if we do P now, you can see that the type has changed. So that's the partition layout all done. So all we need to do is press W to write it. And if we now do F this minus L, we should see those changes that have been made to oops to the SDA disk. So next thing is file systems. I'm going to create the all the uh, file systems at X4, which is the most modern EXT file system. There are others here if you have any reason to use them. By all means, do so. Uh, BTRFS, ButterFS, it's um, very smart uh, file system. Uh, a bit like the ZFS file system, although it's not as mature. Um, and as it says here, it's not production ready. I, I've avoided it because of that reason, and also because I've been using ZFS for, well, possibly, I don't know, getting on for 10 years or so. I imagine I've, um, I've never had any problems with ZFS. So that's the one I use for all my, my data and my servers. But... Uh, ZFS is that is not BTRFS. Uh, if you're feeling brave, you can try it, but uh, I wouldn't recommend it. So that's why I'm going to stick with X4 for this system. So it shows you here some of the commands you can use, and it also says about using this small option uh, for um, small partitions which are less than eight gigabytes. So I'll use this command here x4 because that's the uh, uh, the file system I want to use. I'll be using that on the boot partition as it's less than 8 gigabytes. So we just type that command in make file system x4. Uh, that's like a type I think that T is. Small inodes I think it says here doesn't it? Bytes per inode. And that's the partition name. And that's done. Now I can recall that command, change the partition to 3, which is our main root partition, that one there. I'll remove the small option because it's not a small disk, it's 48 gig, which is a lot bigger than 8 gig. Uh, and that's all I need to do. So it's MKFS X4 on the third partition. You can see that took slightly longer. And there's some more information there about um, what file systems are supported directly on the minimal CD and it looks like they're all supported. And it also tells you what Gen 2 package uh, provides the support, the user space tools to support these file systems. So if you've followed the Linux from scratch videos, you'll recognize E2FS progs, which is a tarball that we downloaded and compiled and installed and here it is in Gen 2 and it's in a category called CSFS system file systems. 
So that's just there for information to help you make your selection. Uh, activating the swap partition. So we need to actually put some data structures on, on the swap partition, a similar way that we've just created data structures on the boot and on the root partition. So to do that, we use command call MK swap, make swap. But obviously it's not SDA3 as it is in the handbook because we're veering slightly off from that. It's SDA2. So we use MK swap dev SDA2. And that's set up. And we can activate that now, which is probably a good idea. With swap on. So you can do a command such as cat forward slash proc forward slash swaps to see what swap files we've got or swap partitions got activated. And there is the one we've just created and activated. Uh, these columns are a little bit out of sequence here because it's such a big swap file. So the file name is that block device there. It's a partition uh, device rather than a file, a swap file. The size is 16 megabyte, uh, gigabytes. Sorry, We've used zero bytes, so that's 16 gigabytes. And the priority is minus two, so it's yeah, fairly high priority. It doesn't matter at the priority because there's only one swap file. But if you had, for example, another swap file on a different device, if you're extending the amount of swap space you had and that device was slower, then you give that a different priority so that uh, the swap mechanism in the kernel will be less likely to use that swap file, that swap device because it is slow. You've told it, you know, it's a lower priority. Don't, don't use it uh, in preference to the higher priority one. As I say, as we've only got one device, it doesn't matter here, the priority. So, um, mounting the root partition. Now the partitions are initialized and our housing file system, it's time to mount those partitions. Use the mount command, but don't forget to create necessary mount directories for every partition created. So, we've got our root, which is on SDA3. So, let's copy this command here and change the SDA4, which we don't have. That would fail if we use that command. We want SDA3, which is our root directory. And it will mount it on this directory, which already exists, because we've booted into a Gen 2 uh, live CD. And this will be one of the differences if you're booting from another uh, flavor of Linux and other distribution, this MNT Gen 2 directory wouldn't exist. You'd have to create that manually. Uh, so let's pre pre press that in, type that in and press enter. So if we look at the file systems that are mounted now, you can see that we've got our root mounted on MNT Gen 2. And before we move on, as it says here, we've got to make sure We've got all the other um, uh, partitions mounted and we have one extra one, which is the boot partition. So we need to make that because if we look at the files on that new system, you'd expect there to be nothing there, which there isn't apart from the usual lost and found directory, which you get when you create a next system for uh, Linux. And that's for uh, when you do a disk check and any uh, orphan files are found that they, they get put into that directory. So we need to create a directory for the boot. So make the MNT Gen 2 boot. So let's recall that command. You can see we've now got that boot directory. And now we need to mount our boot partition, which is SDA1 onto that boot directory, that boot mount point. So the command is mount space forward slash dev forward slash SDA1, which is our boot directory back here. Remember the 128 megabyte one. And we put that onto forward slash mount forward slash gen2 forward slash boot. And of course, because MNT gen2 is uh, the third partition of our disk, this directory we've created will have gone onto that disk and not onto the live CD. So now let's do another view of the partitions that are mounted. 
and you can see there's our boot partition with 110 megabytes remaining which is more than enough for quite a few kernels so the next stage is what they call installing stage 3 now it used to be just about the time that I started getting into Gen 2 there used to be several stages that you'd um, basically install like a stage 1 and 2 and it would involve you re recompiling uh, a basic tool chain um, a bit like what we did in Linux from scratch um, but I think because that was quite a complex way of doing things they've tried to make it a little bit easier so now we ho only have the stage 3 which is something, it's a tarball that we download and it provides us with a working, a basic working system which um, we can configure and boot from. So it says the first thing to do is to make sure the date is set correctly and that is a very good recommendation because yeah, if you do have a bit of skew in the time or date then you can get problems. So let me just check that. Well, that is the correct time. It's actually 2 o'clock here at the moment, but as you can see, the time zone for that day is UTC or GMT. Um, and I'm in British summer time, which is plus one hour, so that's actually correct. So I don't need to make any changes there. Uh, it describes how to either set up a... Um, use a... Uh, daemon to set the clock automatically or set it manually but I'm not going to bother with that it, you, you could, as I say the time is right for me, if you need to set it it's probably just quicker just to type in this date command the next bit choosing a stage tarball we need to choose whether we're going to go for multi-lib where we can install 32 and 30 bit libraries or go for a pure 64 bit, which they call a no multi lib installation. So, as before with Linux from scratch, it's going to be a pure 64 bit system. There's going to be no support for 32 bit uh, binaries. And that shouldn't be a problem because um, we're building everything from scratch. So, unless there's something particular about 32 bit source, which I'm not aware there is. Um, it should be okay, although it does say here those who are just starting out with Gen 2 should not choose no multi-lib tarball unless it is absolutely necessary. To be quite honest, um, I did start on 32-bit, but I don't really recall there being any differences. It may be um, if you are on 64-bit that you can't download certain binaries or certain you know, pre-compiled packages, I, I don't know, but I've I've never had any problems at all in the stuff that I do. So if, if you choose to go 32-bit or, sorry, multi-lib, um, by all means do so. But uh, I'm going to be demonstrating a pure 64-bit uh, installation here. This is worth uh, heeding this warning here when you do make your choice. Be aware migrating from a no multi-lib to a multi-lib system requires an extremely well-working knowledge of Gen 2 and the lower-level tool chain. It may even cause our two chain developers to shudder a little. It's not for the faint of heart and it's beyond the scope of this guide. So, as it say, if you do go from a no multi lib, which is the 64 bit, and you decide you do need the multi lib, then it's it's not impossible, but it's going to be hard work. So, if you do think you might want 32 bit capability, then stick the multi lib. So we've got to get this tarball, this stage 3 tarball. So the first thing we do is change into our new Gen 2, Mount Gen 2 directory, which, if you consider for a moment, this is going to be the root of the new system. And at the moment, it's just mounted at MNT Gen 2, so we've got access to it on the file system. But this will be the root of the new system. Um... Those using environments with fully graphical web browsers will have no problem copying the stage file URL. So this is what we would have been if we'd been booting from the live DVD. We would have had access within the booted environment to a um, a GUI um, and and a web browser, a graphical web browser. But inside the 
minimal CD, it's minimal because a lot of this stuff's missing. So, for example, if I type start X, there's no start X because there's no X at all. There's no Firefox. It's a purely text environment. So um, that's why we're having to uh, SSH in just to make life a bit easier for us. And it's given us some commands here to get hold of this stage three uh, via the command line as well as graphical. So we'll be choosing one of these. So it says more traditional readers or old time Gentoo use, users working exclusively from the command line may prefer using links um, to download. So Linux doesn't need to be about command line, but there's certainly so much more power by being able to use the command line so we will use the command line option we are getting our hands dirty here with compiling packages so it's right that we should do it this way i think um, especially if you want to learn a little bit more about uh, linux and uh, well gen 2 and linux in general to be quite honest so this options if we want to use a proxy um, there's also as well as the links L I N K S. There's also a links L Y N X. And if you saw Linux from scratch, that's my preferred text browser. So I shall use that one. And it's not installed on the on the minimal CD, so I won't use that one. So I will use L I N K S and see how I get on with it. Okay, so there's a little bit of a welcome screen there. So I'll just press enter to take the OK. So here's this source mirrors web page, which is the one we saw before in uh, Chromium here on the left when we we're downloading the minimal CD image. It's the same page. You can see it looks a little bit different. So UK mirror, because that's the country I'm in. Please select the mirror that's closest to you. You'll get a better speed, put less strain on the interweb. And I'll go down to the uh, UK Mirror Service. I'll select this option here, press enter there. And again, you can see there's the directory layout of this server at this point here. So um, it tells us here where we need to move to releases, AMD64 auto builds, which again is the same place we went to before. So just press the down arrow to move the cursor to releases and press enter. Move the down arrow again to AMD64, press enter, and then press the down arrow again all the right way down to auto builds. And here you can see there's various stage three images that are available. Um, right, so select one and press D to download, it says. So we, oops, I didn't know you could actually click on it. So I just found out something there. Uh, I'll stick with the keyboard so you can see what happens. So we want one that's called current. And we've got to find one that says no multi-lib because that's what I'm, creating one that's not got 32-bit libraries in it. So it looks like that is the one I want there. If you don't want the um, minimal, which one do you need? Uh, yeah, if you don't want the no multi-lib one, this is the directory you'll need here. Current stage 3 AMD64. So if you want the mixed 32-bit and 64-bit libraries, that's the option you want. As I'm sticking with a pure 64-bit, this is the option I'm going for. So press enter there and press down arrow. Looks like there's actually a multi-lib version there. Yeah, looks like there's all types there. There's a 64-bit multi-lib, 64 no multi-lib, and looks like there's a 32-bit one there as well. But I'll go down the directories that 
that look more pertinent to the one you, you're downloading. So as I say, if you want the multi-lib one, go to that other directory I highlighted and download whatever's in there. So the multi-lib, oh, sorry, no multi-lib, that is the stage three tar file that I want. So let's press D on that one with it highlighted. Save to file, just press enter. We'll just wait for that to download. Okay, so it's downloaded. So I'm just going to download these other files which have got digests and the list of the files that are in this directory. So it's just worth getting hold of them so that, um, yeah, we can confirm that the downloads are fine, which I'm sure they will be. So just highlight the next one, press D. Highlight the next one, press D again. And the next one, press D again. And that's it, it's just those four files we need. So now uh, we can press Q to quit. Do you really want to exit? Yes. And if we look at the directory, you can see there's the files that we've just downloaded. So there's a bit of information there about the fact that some of the tarballs are div delivered with XZ compression which you can see this one has done it's just saying to change these commands uh, to reflect the, f the fact that they're tar xz rather than tar bz and describes what the contents of files are that we don't just downloaded and it gives some examples of how we can verify these files. So if you copy that part of the command and then just press tab in the command window in the console, you'll get the rest of the um, file name anyway, regardless of whether it's a tar, bz or xz. Press enter there and you can see there's the uh, signature, the SHA512 signature for that file and if we view the digests file you can see that the signature we got by running this open SSL command matches the signature that's been provided and there's another way to run this command here and again you can see the signature is the same and then there's a command to validate the whirlpool checksum, which is another one that's been given in the digests file. So we can run that as well to check. And you can just check that with the whirlpool hash 1954. It starts 1954 and finishes with A945. So it all looks quite, quite good. And another option here to validate the file is to use GPG. Oh, right, okay, sorry, that should have digests.asc on the back. Right, sorry, uh, This should be with these curly brackets because there's two options there. Not detached signature, not sure what that means. Yeah, I'm not sure what that means, but um, 
it's certainly not an error. But anyway, with, with the previous commands, the, the, it's proved that this has been validated and it's uh, it's obviously a good download and we're not going to get any problems with it. So let's run this tar command. Um, it explains why they've got these options here and uh, extra uh, options attached to the end of this command. So it's worth not deviating from this, just copy and paste it in. Yeah, okay, so this is a bit where it's got BZ2 but no XZ. So let's just rub this out and just tab that stage 3. We'll get the proper file name. That should work then. So as you saw, that's extracting a system. Um, and if we list the what will be the root of our new uh, Gen 2 system, you can see it's created directories, and inside those directories are files with executable bits and links and so on. So this is basically the seed of our Gen 2 system. We don't compile everything from scratch as we do with Linux from scratch. We start with a core basic system with, I think, yeah, it's, I don't know, 20 packages. Um, maybe a few more than that, come to think of it, that's installed. Just some basic packages, which is the, the minimal system that we will uh, boot our new Gen 2 system from. So, uh, the next thing is configuring compile options. Now there's loads of configurations which alter the way Gen 2 compiles um, and the main file that is used to control configuration is this make.conf and it has, it's basically, excuse me a minute, <coughs> basically a um, a config file that affects the global settings for the system. So if we load that up in this nano editor, which is a very basic and simple to use editor, you can see there's already some settings in there. Um, so we're going to be adding quite a bit of information to this file to, to customize how our system and how we want uh, Gen 2 to compile. And you can see, as usual, comments uh, prefixed with hashes. So every other line is deemed to be a command, apart from blank lines. So the first one we've got here is C flags and CXX flags. So in Linux from scratch, I deliberately avoided mentioning these because I found when compiling and running the tests that they can have an adverse effect on the quality of the code that's produced um, can cause tests to fail and so on. Uh, with Gen 2, the, because the packages aren't directly from the uh, source, if you like, they've been vetted and verified by Gen 2 uh, maintenance team. It, uh, it's a bit easier to use uh, flags to adjust how the compile uh, works and to optimize things a little bit. Um, I've, I've used some quite aggressive flags on Gen 2 in the past and uh, the worst that I've had happen is uh, the build fails. Uh, I've never had actually runtime errors that I could attribute to using um, compiler flags that are a bit, a bit wacky. Uh, even despite saying that it's still worth sticking with some basic uh, you know, basic flags don't don't go too silly especially if you've never done this before um, there is a Gen 2 page somewhere which 
describes what they call safe C flags and CXX, CXX flags. Um, that's that's worth a read just so that you've got an idea what's safe to use and what's not safe to use. So one flag I always used to put on here was something called F minus F omit frame pointer, but this optimization here O2 includes that flag, so it's not worth putting that in anymore. Um, if you've not used these before, O2 is an optimization flag and it causes the uh, compiler to make certain optimizations. If you look at the GCC manual, it will explain all these switches in great amount of detail. Uh, there's several levels of optimization to optimize for size, uh, speed, I believe, and then there's several O, 1, 2, and 3 flags for um, optimizing the actual speed. Um, O3 is generally not recommended as it's a bit too aggressive and it can cause problems. I, I did used to uh, compile with O3 and I did used to get strange things happening so I've stopped using that. O2 is a pretty good uh, flag to have and as you can see it's one that Gen 2 have recommended because it's there. In fact I've just noticed here it says um, O3 is known to cause problems and use system wise, so recommend to use O2. You may see as you if you watch the compile that certain packages do enable O3 in certain places. So obviously the, the people who've written those packages have tested and know that the, the O2 uh, sorry the O3 option is a good option for them and it gives them the extra uh, speed or uh, extra functionality that's required with that switch but just stick with O2 is my advice. Um, another thing you can do here is to put in uh, a couple of parameters to tune the processor you're on. By default as it stands the flags as they are will just produce generic I686 uh, code um, we can actually tune this further by, I'm just looking up to see what I've got this machine set at, just so I can copy from it. If you excuse me one moment. Um, yeah, you can get it to optimize the code even more for the processor you are using. So for this machine, which is a, an i7, I think it's a 4000 series chip, um, it's got various um, uh, tunable parameters, uh, but it's it's the core that you need to look at. Uh, what sort of technology it is, and if you look at um, let's type man GCC. Uh, yeah, if you go to the GCC manual, oh, this is an old one, 4.74, let's see if we've got a newer one. Right, so Gen 2 is using 8.3, I believe, at the moment. So click that first one there, 8.3, and then we want command options and then you want to look for AMD 64 I reckon it would be oh, or x86 options there down the bottom yeah see this march is a parameter which allows you to tune the code, the compilation of the code to a particular processor so you can see if we are compiling for a Pentium you could use either i586 or, or the word Pentium but for newer uh, processors you need to know what the core technology is um, behind the, the chip you've got and you can see it gets quite quite modern as individual ones and basically each each one is in, in, a, in enabling uh, more optional functions as you can see the newer the technology the more options are being enabled that the CPU can support so say so the chip I've got is an i7-4000 series, um, so it's a Haswell core. 
So that's what I can type in on this command here. I can type minus M, which is for machine flag, arch for ar the architecture, equals Haswell. And there's another option called tune, minus M tune, which I set to the same setting. And that one will produce uh, the difference is the arch produces code that will specifically run on that architecture that I've specified or newer. The tune will produce code which is compatible with any architecture but is optimized for Haswell. So I could put i686 in as the arch and it would work on an i686 even though I've got the tune as Haswell and it's because it's optimized for the Haswell technology but it's using instructions that run on the i686. There's also another option called native where it tries to guess what the hardware is and through what I've seen on the internet and my own tests the native option is not always that reliable. The code it can produce doesn't seem to be quite the same as specifying it directly and that's also, it doesn't seem to be quite as good code. Either the code runs a little bit slower or, well, I won't say that I've ever had problems with it because I can't recall ever having problems. But in, in my own tests over the years, I've found that specifying the arch and tune to the architecture that you're using is more than good enough. It's, it's what I would consider to be the best option. Now there used to be other options that you could add in here. Um, certainly if you're doing this on Linux from scratch, this is the way you do it. Where you can add in these these options as separate flags. So for example, MMX would be minus M, MMX, and SSE would be minus M, SSE, and so on. But Gen 2 now has a separate um, a separate variable to take these and the reason is they've identified which packages make use of these optimizations um, so it's not really worth putting that you I suppose you could put them in there in case there is any package that doesn't identify or has been identified by the gen 2 team as having these uh, optimizations or these extra functions but the way that it's done now in gen 2 is that you have this um, uh, CPU flags variable and what you do is you assign the capabilities for example MMX SSE into this variable now how do you know exactly what core you've got and what flags you've got that you can enable well traditionally the, the only way you do it is you, you'd have to go on the internet you'd, you'd have to know exactly what chip you've got for a start off you know what what version is it an i3 i5 is it a core 2 or an amd or whatever then you have to find out you know exactly what model or version number it was then you'd have to go on the internet and look to find out what architecture it was ca what capability it was and it was a bit bit hit and miss you, you could you know just one one model can be different for example as uh, if you look at pentium 4s all the pentium 4s are 32 bit except for the later pentium 4s there are some pendant fours that are 64 bit. So the earlier ones would go in as a Pentium 4. But the newer 64 bits would go in as uh sorry, the some of yeah, it could be Pentium 4 or Prescott. The newer 64 bits, I believe off the top of my head, they can go in as Westmere I believe off the top of my head I think that's right so you can see they're quite a lot different from a Pentium 4 we've only got MMX, SSE and SSE 2 to Westmere which has got all these other options here even if it was just a, a, say a core 2 you know that you've got two extra commands there two extra functions so it's quite easy to make to make the uh, wrong selection so what the kind people at Gen 2 have done is they've given us a tool to um, identify these 
with the tool so we don't have to do any of this work so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do control X here to save this save the modify buff buffer yes press enter so that's saved those settings and the command that you need to type in is, is it CPU ID right it's not actually on here um, let me just check that that's the right command I'm putting in yeah it is okay so this is something we'll have to do when we're in the system we can't run it at the moment I thought it was part of the minimal it may be as part of the live DVD um, in fact no it's no it's something quite new actually so it won't be on the live DVD <clears throat> but what I can do is I can run it on the host system to show you what the output would be yeah that's the command there CPU ID to CPU flags what happens if we run that is it interrogates the processor and it gives us what it thinks the processor is capable of and this is what we can type in onto the make.conf so what I should do is I won't do that now because you wouldn't have access to this especially if you're on a, a physical box you wouldn't be able to just get another terminal up uh, or would you? Yes, you would be able to actually if you did the control alt F1 or F2. So, yes, you could possibly do this. Um, but then you're off the booting, booting off the minimal CD. So, no, you wouldn't. No, so I'm not going to do that. I'll just get rid of that. And we'll have to add that in when we've got the new system running. So what I should do is just leave CPU flags, I'll rem put a remark there so it's not used at all. I'll leave it blank as well and then we can fill that in when we've got the system up and running and we'll take any advantage of uh, any optimizations. There shouldn't be any on the outset, there may be one or two, for example SSH possibly, but it's not going to be a big deal. So they've given some examples here. They're actually using native, which is like fairly safe. Like I say, if you don't know what system you're using, then it's a safe bet. Or you could just leave it out completely. That 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 option, just leave it out and just just go with the O2 pipe that they had as default. And it's even got the links for GCC optimization with Gen 2. There's lots of information there. But optimization, there's the CPU ID to CPU flags that we just run. It describes how to install it. So yeah, let, actually I'll leave that up. We can do that when, pardon me, when we've got the um, uh, system up and running. And there's this article about the safe C flags that I mentioned before. I think it seals all the different types of architectures for the AMD and the Intel there, as well as some other architectures and what it does it goes through for each uh, architecture and gives some suggestions as to for what depending on what you get when you look at the um, CPU info I'll just say this again so if I do cat forward slash proc CPU info it's it's identifying the vendor ID so obviously this is an Intel, so genuine Intel, that's okay. CPU family 6, model 60, the model name. So I've got a 4770K, they've got an E3, whatever here. Uh, the model, what have they repeated that? Oh, it's the different cores, that's right. So it's showing that it's got different cores. So it's showing that the... Uh, family and the model that that is a is confirming that that is a Haswell architecture so these are suggested settings as well as the C host I've noticed they don't put the C host in anymore in the make 
Conf. They used to. Um, so we could copy that in. It's something that shouldn't be changed anyway, so it's probably just using a default, but we can put that in just for completeness. So I'll just paste that in. So let's just save that again. So say if you identify your your CPU um, based on what uh, CPU info says on that that command there, cat forward slash proc forward slash CPU info, compare it and search it and compare it what what's listed here, and then you'll um, you should get some some good. Uh, Good settings for optimization, and as I say, later on we can get the the uh, CPU flags added in. So let's go back to the make.conf. The next option they've got is make ops, and this is uh, a default similar to the one that we had in Linux from scratch, which tells make how many parallel jobs to run. So I'm going to copy that in. I've got six cores, so I'm going to put six in there. So that means every package that gets compiled will attempt to run on six cores. So now we can do Control X again to save it. You can see down here it says Control X is exit. Save to buffer, press Y for yes, and press enter. So the next bit installing the base system. So selecting mirrors, so these are mirrors where information for the Gen 2 system is uh, selected and downloaded. So if we run this command, what it does, it, it allows us to pick some mirrors and then the mirrors that we've selected automatically get written to the make.conf file that we've just been editing. So if I load it up again, See at the bottom, the last line is LC messages. After we run this command, um, that, that will have changed. So let's paste that command in, press enter. You see we've got this menu here. So all you need to do is go down to your country and you know, just search for your country in the list so you'll get the, the closest mirrors. So there's all the UK ones for me. And just press spacebar to select all the ones that you wish to use. So that's all of mine. And just press OK. So now if we edit the make.conf file again, you'll see it's added them. Right, OK. Let me just come out of this again. This W turns, minus W turns off word wraps. So you can't see everything. So let's retry that. Oh no, it doesn't. I thought that did. Not sure why that's or what that's doing actually. Right, there's no man pages on this minimal CD. It really is what it says. It is minimal. Uh, okay, so let's go back to the minus W. But basically, you've on this Gen 2 mirrors, you've got a whole list of. Uh, URLs, which are the ones we selected in that nice graphical uh, tool that we just ran. And it's just listed them all in there inside quotes with space between each one. So, for example, the first one there, FTP, mirror byte mark, that's the first one. Then there's a space and then there's a second one and so on. So, now we... This is for the files that is dis distributed. The next bit we've got to do is make an eBuild repository. So we've got to tell our system where it can uh, go and fetch the eBuild information, which is like a catalog or an index of, of the packages that Gen2 has within, within its system. And there's something like, well, I'm not sure, about 20 or 1,000, I think, packages. So it's not as big as some of the distributions. You know, I think Debian and Ubuntu and the likes have got you know twenty six thousand packages, but it's it's up there. There's more than enough to keep you occupied. So the first thing we need to do is to make a directory. 
uh, it says it can be done in a few simple steps. If it does not exist, create the repos.conf directory where it's unlikely to exist because this is a new system. So let's create that. Now copy the Gen2 repository configuration file provided by Portage to the newly created repos.conf directory. So let's copy all that command there. Okay, so now we can edit that file and view it. So that's the file we just copied in from uh, the, this location here. And the important bit really is this bit here. It shows it does an R sync to this location to, to get the changes for all the packages. Now, one thing about this is that you're not supposed to sync up the e builds more than once a day. The reason is R sync can be quite processor intensive and it's frowned upon to to keep syncing up um, and you're likely to be banned if you keep syncing up uh, because of that because I've got several machines that run Gen 2 I've got a local server which does the syncing for me once a day and then I just sync to my local machine so I can sync as many times as I want so what I should do is I'm just going to uh, get up the configuration for that to change it to my local server but you wouldn't need to change this you could just leave that as it is um, and if if it's something that's uh, of interest I, I will create a video to show how to set up your local sync server it's, it's fairly simple um, I'll make another video for that that would be something I could do so if you just bear with me a minute I'll just get up the uh, details I need for that on another window yep so all I need to do is change this this bit here to my local server so I'll just put the IP address in Right, okay, this is what's confusing me now. I thought I'm going to quit from here. I thought for a moment I was in Nano then, and I wasn't, I was in Vi, so that's confused me. Right, so I'll just put the address in of my server, and I'll leave the rest alone. Nothing else needs to be changed. As I say, I'm only doing this for my own situation just so that I don't get banned from the sync server um, but you should only need to sync once a day anyway but uh, as I say like I've, I've got several machines I've already done a sync um, on a couple of machines today internally I've basically got a server which has got a cron job which syncs up in the morning you know, about two or three o'clock in the morning I think it is and then that server serves the sync information to all, all my other machines that I run. So as I say, there shouldn't be anything else I need to, need to change, it's just purely to view that and I've just gone in there to change it for my own needs. Then it says we need to copy over the DNS info from etc. resolve.conf, I think we looked at this already. So that's the one that's been found when we booted and what it's saying is we'll copy that into our new uh, root because it won't exist at the moment. So if we do ls etc, see resolve, it's not there at all, I can't tab it, it just doesn't exist. So it's just not there. So if we do this command, uh, can see it's now there and it's the same as the one in the root. So the next thing, this is similar to Linux from scratch again, we need to mount some of the uh, virtual file systems 
so that they're available uh, for when we chroot into our new system, which again is similar to Linux from scratch. We, we chroot into it to make it appear as if that's our new root system um, to allow us to finish the configuration off. So all we need to do is just copy these commands in to attach these virtual file systems into the MNT directory, MNT Gen 2 directories just so they're available when we're in the true environment. And it says here as a warning if you're using non-Gen 2 installation media, so again it's another exception, so we are, so we can ignore that. Now we can do as we did before with Linux from scratch, we can do the true command to make our root, which is currently on mount Gen 2, we can make that the real root. Reread the profile settings to update the environment and just change the prompt to remind us that we're in a Truth environment. Um, I think we've probably done this already, but we can check because that should work. Yeah, boot's already mounted, so we don't need to do this command here. So next thing we need to do is to get an initial index of uh, all the uh, eBuild repositories. So there's a function here, a command here that does this for us, emerge web sync. So if we just type that in, ignore the um, errors that the uh, lo repository location doesn't exist, that, that's only for this, this one time. It says there, don't worry about the missing user portage location. Okay, so that has finished um, downloading. You can see it's giving you a status of the sort of thing that it's done. Um, and there's some information there about some Nuva's items that need to be read. Um, but before we do that, there's a couple of other commands, or one other command that needs to be run. Uh, this emerge sync is the command that uh, must only be run once a day. Um, this is the command that will contact the rsync server to fetch all the latest updates for um, the eBuild repository. So, uh, so just be careful how often you run this. Um, certainly no more than once every 24 hours. So just paste that in and run it. And you can see um, what you've got here on the left is various categories and then within that is each um, uh, package that belongs to that category. There's actually not that many updates so it's probably because this um, is updated about a week ago. I noticed the minimal CD has had a date of yesterday on it so it's probably the same for this initial um, cache that was set up. So you can see that the timestamp of this was 1 o'clock this morning UTC, which would have been 2 o'clock here, so that's probably about the time that my server contacted the main rsync server. So it's probably you know, 13 hours out of date now, but it's, it's not a great deal. I think it gets updated every few hours or so, but you know, 24 hours is more than enough. You, you won't want to be updating every day. It's, uh, it can take quite some time up if you do it too often. I'd say once a week is probably a good good time to update um, any any Gen 2 machines you have. So, uh, reading news items, when Gen 2 eBuild repository synchronizes system portage, may warn the user with messages similar to the following. 
So the thing to do here is to use a command called eselect and eselect you do it on its own will tell you what modules you've got, what you can do. So you can operate eselect on any of these modules here and this changes as you add and delete um, packages to the system you'll find that this will probably grow and you can see one of them is called news so if you do eselect news on its own it tells you what you can do with eselect news all the commands you can do so normally one I do is list and it'll list all the items and you can read individual ones with eselect news read and then the number in the square brackets at the left so for example I want to read the first one and it gives you some information on that that particular email so it's uh, yes like a kind of email but the news news item um, if you do you select news on its own it'll just read the whole lot uh, sorry read it'll read the whole lot and it'll just scroll straight off the screen and also once you've read them they change colour so they're not dark blue anymore, they've gone grey to show that they've been red. So um, it may be worth reading these uh, in your own time. Um, some might not make a great deal of sense initially but it's worth reading them just in case there is some things there that um, help help you understand how the Gen 2 system works. And also they're, they're there, you know, they'll be there tomorrow, next week, whatever until they're outdated, in which case they get removed. Um, so I'm not going to read them because I've read them many times before um, and a lot of these news items has to do with changes to an existing way of doing something. So for example that open SSH one it says it disables these SSH DSS keys by default um, and that GCC one it says it defaults to a new ABI so it's it's more about changes that are happening to the system so that means that because we're building a new system from scratch those changes will already be incorporated and they will be using the new way of doing things that are described in these news items so the next thing we need to do is choosing the right profile and a profile in Gen 2 is like a basic uh, system or structure or expected packages that form the basis of your Gen 2 system and again we access this through eSelect so if we do eSelect on its own you see there's a profile option there so if we do eSelect profile again it shows you what actions there are, you can list the profiles, you can change the profile or you can show the profile so if we do profile list, so there's a great big profile of four, or list of 45 profiles there. Now currently I believe one of those news items stated that profile 17.1, this is basically the year number and then a number starting at zero. That's, uh, well in fact it says dev here behind it, it's, it's experimental if you like, so don't select anything. Uh, sorry, don't select anything that's got 17.1 in it. Um, yeah, in fact, it says here this warning do not select any of the 17.1 profiles unless you read the corresponding news item. Uh, profile 13, well, that's 2013. That's, that's going to be quite old, even though it's a stable version. You probably don't want that unless you have a particular reason for it. So you want to concentrate on the 17.0 profiles. I just noticed some down here looks like they're specialist ones so you probably don't want to be looking at them either. So it's just these ones here between 12 and 26 and you can see that by default number 22 on my list is selected which is the no multi-lib profile. There are other profiles if you wanted to install a plasma i.e. KDE 5 system you might want to select that one although bear in mind this will be a multi-lib profile so if you want to stick to the no multi-lib it's a bit more work but you can guarantee that you will have pure 64-bit uh, binaries built and installed again if you want a GNOME installation it will be a multi-lib but there's a profile there which pre-selects a lot of configuration for you 
There's also one there if you want to use system D. It's not the recommended uh, startup device yet. System D RC, RC is still the Gen 2's recommended one, as far as I'm aware. So that's why probably why there's only one profile with that. Uh, and then there's like security and hardened options there as well if you uh, know anything about that. And then it looks like there's a really basic one there. You can go there without any pre-configuration or very, very minimal. So this one for me, for what my intentions are, which is to have a pure 64-bit environment is fine. I don't need to change that. And that's probably pre-selected because we pre-downloaded or downloaded a uh, no multi-lib uh, stage three image if you do wish to change it to change it you do e select profile set and then the number in the square brackets on the left so for example 19 if you wanted the plasma desktop profile like that um, yeah, as it says here, the output of the command above in the example is is just that, an example, and it evolves over time. So this list does change as they add and remove profiles, which isn't that often, as you can see. The one prior to the current one, which is 17.0, well, the 17.1 appeared a few months after 17.0, as I remember, and the one prior to that was four years ago. Uh, you know, prior to, well, sorry, it's six years ago now. Uh you know, prior to the 2017 one was four years earlier than that so the profiles don't change that much um, heed the warning that profile upgrades are not to be taken lightly there's so many changes and configuration differences in between different profiles you know make your choice now and don't plan on changing it unless you either want to have lots of work moving across the profiles or prepare to install from scratch again. Uh, in order to select a pure 64 bit environment, use a no multi lib profile. So that's what we're sticking with. You can see their option for that one is five. And you can see how old these instructions are because they're still referring to profiles from the 13.0 branch. Okay, so the next bit it mentions is about updating the at world set. Um, perhaps a bit of explanation here about what this set is. Gen 2 has this concept of sets, and a set is a set of packages. And there are two sets that come, well actually there's quite a few sets, but there's two that you only need to be concerned really about. There's a system set which is effectively uh, packages to do with the system. They're, they're more or less everything that we've um, acquired by expanding the stage three tarball. So that'll be things like that. They're essential to running the system. So that'll be things like the GCC, bin utils, glibc, the kernel. Uh, sorry, not the kernel. Uh, make, patch, all those sort of basic packages that we need to to maintain and run the system. Um, interestingly, one of them is Nano, which is the editor. Um, I always used to get rid of Nano, but I found out the reason why they use that is because it is a nice basic editor. Um, Vim's a, or Vim or Vi is a bit more of an advanced editor, needs a few more libraries. So that's why Nano is in there as one of the system uh, packages so if you try to remove nano nano it will warn you because it says it's part of the system profile or the system set rather so you don't you probably don't want to be doing that just install vim in addition to nano uh, i think again the idea is if anything happens to the system you've got this basic uh editor but it's still a usable editor uh the world set is a list of packages that you've added yourself so for example if I wanted to add in um, I don't know for example Wesnoth the game we installed at the end of Beyond Linux from scratch when I add that in it becomes part of the world set so that 
when I do a tidy up and get rid of any dependencies that don't uh, or are not needed anymore, it knows, because Wesnoth is part of the world set, not to get rid of that. It is a top-level package that I want kept. Um, so that's what it is. So it's you can look at the world, what's in the world set. I can't remember the command to do it now, but you can actually look at the file. There's a file on here. Uh, it's in varlib portage yeah world there it is there so it's empty at the moment so that means all the packages that we've currently got installed at the moment are part of the system set but when you refer to the world not only does it refer to packages you've identified you've installed yourself it refers to this, the system set as well. So you could say the system set is a subset of the world set. So this next command that is saying about updating the world set, because there's nothing in the world, you can see, well, we're not really updating anything, but we are because the system set is a subset of the world set. So it's a chance that by running this command, we're going to do some updates. It might not be much of a chance, because as I say, it seems like the repository that we've installed is, is reasonably up to date. So I'll just run that and you can see this emerge command is working out some dependencies. Um, the command lines here, the, sorry, the command options, ask means it's going to ask us if we want to install these packages. So that's what this prompt here is doing. If we didn't do that, it would just go ahead and start installing them. Verbose gives us some more information about what packages are going to be installed. So um, we get things like what use switches, I'll explain these a little bit later on, uh, are going to be uh, activated. Update says that we want to uh, identify any packages that need to be updated. Deep means it does a deep search uh, down, the, down the, all the dependencies. Uh, and new use, which is what these are, these are use flags. It says also identify any packages that not only want to be updated, but also have got use flags that have been changed since the uh, last emerge was run and then the last bit on the end is I want to update everything in the world set and as I say because the world is empty at the moment these are basically all system packages they're all part of the system so for each one of these ebuild segments here so that is one package there what this is saying is it's identifying that it's an e-build, a Gen 2 e-build. The R means it's going to be reloaded, so it's going to be rebuilt rather. This is the um, section, if you like, that the package belongs to. So it's development libs, development libraries. This is the package name and its version, and this is the repository it's coming from, Gen 2. So that together is a uniquely identifiable package. Then it's telling us what use flags have been enabled. So the ones in red are use flags that are already enabled. So this is saying that libpcre has got uh, has got vzip2 capabilities, it's got CSX capabilities, JIT, etc. The one that's in brackets means that it's a capability that's been forced by the eBuild, which is like the definition file for libpcre. The eBuild it's quite a detailed text document, if you like, that describes how libpcre will be will be built and what dependencies are required. So, for example, if we turn on this libedit use environment uh, use variable, the uh, ebuild would describe what dependent dependent libraries, if any, are required by by this uh, use variable. So the ones, as I've already alluded to, the ones that are in blue and got a minus in front of them are not activated. So this means that there's no dependency required by this lib edit, nor in the same way with these two here, PCRE 16 and 32. The one in green shows what the change is. So that is the reason why this package, libpcre, is being rebuilt. It's being rebuilt because the currently installed version has got static libs enabled but 
because it's got a minus in, the, the new change is that we want this turned off. Or not we we have we haven't said it, it's it's what the update is. And you've also got a little star next to it as well. That's probably if you're viewing this either, you know, it's been printed out or you're viewing it in black and white, you would you wouldn't be able to see what's changed because this this would look just like you know, they they would look all the same. So that little star is showing that that's a change as well. <clears throat> in a similar way you can see that file caps here has been activated it's currently at the moment it's not activated but it's in green so it so shows that it's a change you can see there's no minus in front of it so you can sh see that it's been activated uh, and likewise bin disk down here is being de deactivated and that's the reason why those ones with the R are being rebuilt then you've got one here with a green N. That means it's a new package. So that's not in the system at the moment, but it's being built because something's dependent on it. So it could be that, well, in fact, it is this file caps. And that's the reason why that is being built before these two packages are being rebuilt to require it. So you can see this is the power or some of the power of the uh, portage system and emerge, the emerge command in particular that you don't get with Linux from scratch because Linux from scratch is just purely about this is how you install this package, these are the commands you type in. Gen 2 takes that a step further, it's it's got the commands required to build the package inside the e-build and it can resolve all the dependencies by itself and that is what it was doing when we ran the command. So while that little things whizzing around it's calculating what packages have changed I, I either they need to be updated or either through the use flags that have changed and then once it's got those what dependencies do I need because of these changes and that's all been taken care of so in Linux from scratch we'd have to do that all by hand and that's where we were opening up tabs all the time and trying to keep on top of what what package do I need to do next you know I need to install package A or package A needs B and B needs C so you install C then you find that B needs D as well and D needs C well we've installed C so that's okay we'll install D then we go back to uh, B and then we go back to A where we began Gen 2 takes care of all that it's so much simpler but you've still got the power of having all these packages built custom built on your system that you're building them on so lastly, at the end of this, you can see it's got a summary of what's going to be done. You can see there's six packages affected. One of them is new, so that's that one there. Five are reinstalls, and it's saying that it needs to fetch 10 megabytes worth of uh, source code. So you can see each one of these packages, it, it shows how big they are. And of course, if you're on a internet connection where you're billed by how much you're downloading, that, that could be quite important to you. Um, you might decide that you only want to install certain packages or you might be limited per day on how much you can download. So you can decide just by manipulating what's going to be installed, uh, how, how much or how little you want to install. So we can either type in Y or yes, or just press enter here to start this installation. And what you'll see, there's some checks done first of all, and then it will go and fetch these packages and you can see if I do control less and stop that for a moment you can see that it's fetched the source it tells you can actually view the fetching in another terminal um, it verifies the signatures it unpacks it it tells you where it's unpacking it to it tells you that it's unpacked it successfully then it prepares it and it's doing that by applying a patch Um, and then it's actually doing some work. Uh, sorry, it's applying more patches there, but looks of it. it says it's uh, finished preparing the source, and then it runs the configure command as we did in uh, Linux from scratch. So if I let that continue, you can see it's it, well, it's gone off the screen, but it's run the configure commands. But you can see this compilation is just like the stuff we saw in Linux from scratch. So you can see it is actually compiling the source code. If I also stop that, you can see the C flags that we've entered are there. The O2 March equals Haswell, the M2 equals Haswell. So that's been uh, copied in as well. 
that's being activated and you can see there's some information there at the end of the build I'll stop that and go back again yeah so it's finished the compilation at that point and it puts a status up saying it's installing it and you can see it's these are all the files it's in, it's installing oops I've just adjusted the uh, yeah this text size okay so just wait for that to finish now While it's running, I'll get another tab open. We can just run top and see that. Yeah, we've got several. Sorry, no, it won't be on this machine. This is the host machine. If I go to the virtual machine and run top, oops. Yeah, you can see that there's one, two, three, four, five compiles running in. in uh, tandem there so we know that the compile is being done in parallel and indeed the machine seems to be running quite slowly as well While it's compiling, I'll just mention about the use flags a bit more. Uh, there's several layers of use flags. The main layer, if you like, is the one that goes in the make.conf file, which we've already seen, and they're global flags. Uh, if you type in Gen2 index uh, use on its own, you'll get the use flag index. Now, this is on the hard disk somewhere, but I find it easier just to use it from a web page. Um, and what this page has is all the use flags that Gen2 understands. I think it gets updated every week. I'm not sure now. It's, it's not updated daily, but it's fairly regular. So you may find sometimes that there's a flag either missing in the package when you're trying to install it that you can't find uh, in this document or vice versa. There's, there's flags here that aren't on the uh, actual package. So that's that's probably why is that there's a bit of a, a delay with when they update update this page. But basically, the first few pages are all the global use flags. So these are the ones that are intended to go into uh, the make.conf file. They don't have to, but that's the right place for them. Then you've got local use flags, and these are use flags which are activated on a per package basis. So you wouldn't ever add these locally because, for example, that MIDI flag that might have a different meaning or different context in another package so you'd never add these to the use flags uh, sorry to make.conf use variable though you may add you might add some of the global flags to uh, the local use flags but I'll show you that in a bit more detail so it is worth having this up because um, this can enable and disable quite a few useful uh, functions and affect how Gen 2 and how, how packages run.
Okay, so those uh, six packages are finished updating. At the end of every emerge, you get um, a list of packages that have got messages. So some of the messages are informational and others are important. So it's worth uh, reading them all um, and acting upon anything that needs to be acted upon. So, for example, this one here, PAM's been updated and it says uh, that some software with preloaded PAM libraries might re experience warnings or failures related to missing symbols. Um, and basically it says because this, it requires you to restart the software manually after the update. Um, and it says you can find the software using that command. Now it won't run because we haven't got LSOF installed. But alternatively you can simply reboot your system. So I'm going to heed that and reboot the system but first of all I'm going to run uh, this command here which is advisable after every update which is emerge depth clean and emerge depth clean what that does is it looks for any dependencies that have now been orphaned and that should be cleaned up so it may be that by um, updating something we've done uh, maybe the version number has been bumped we've still got the old version of the package uh, lying around on the system or um, a package that used to be uh, a dependency of another package is now not required by that package for some reason um, so depth clean will remove these orphan dependencies so I normally run it with depth clean and minus a to ask me you don't want to run depth clean on its own because there are times where you don't want to clean up immediately. You may want to do some other work before you do the depth clean. So if you run depth clean minus A, I think you can also use P, which is pretend it's probably the safest option. If I do it with the minus P, uh, it's funny, it says you have no world file. That's interesting. It's probably because there's no nothing in the world file at the moment. But there's nothing there anyway. P is the safest command when you're using Emerge because it's a pretend option. Um, I normally use A, but it's not as safe because when it does ask you the question, you could accidentally press Enter and it will go ahead and do the stuff because Enter is deemed to be the same as Yes, whereas P will just run and then just exit. It won't give you the chance to say Yes, to go ahead and, and do it. Um, so it might be worth just using P initially as a dry run when you're satisfied that uh, whatever Emerge is going to do that you've asked it to do, if, if you're happy it's going to do it the right way, then you, then you can put in A or, or just leave out the A or P. But it's a good habit to have uh, minus P or minus A on the command line before you actually commit to doing anything. And as I say, P is, is more recommended when you're learning than minus A. Uh, it's a lot, lot safer. So I'm going to reboot at this point. So I'll just type reboot here. Right, okay, we're in the true route, so we can't reboot. I just realized that. So I'm going to go with it, see see how we are at the moment, just live with what we've got. I hope I haven't shut down anything else. No. We'll just carry on because it's not... Although it's not mentioned in there, um, we should be okay. Um, I think it just mentioned if you get any spurious things going on. Yeah, you might get warnings of failures related to missing symbols and or versions of the update. So uh, I think we'll be okay to carry on. So it now gives us some more information about the use variables. And as I say, it's in, in the make.conf. Um, and this is the way that it's easy to activate and deactivate features of packages. And using this command here, you can find out what use variables are currently um, enabled. So this lists all the variables, in fact. So you can see, for example, um, there's the CPU flag. So the default one at the moment, the one I was saying before, it's got this MMX, MMX, X, and SSE and SSE2. But when we looked at the Haswell uh, architecture, it, it could do a lot more. So that is something we've still got to do to update that. Um, it's got Apache 2 modules, even though we haven't got any uh, Apache 
uh, web server added in. These these are all like defaults, if you like. The kernels defaulted to Linux. Uh, video cards, a whole load of things there. So these are things we can override and we can change. But the one we're interested in at the moment is this one here, which is the use. So that's the use variables that are currently activated. So what's a good idea is as that's what we've currently got, if we copy that and then modify the make.conf file, we can paste that in there and use that as a, a seed. If I can find the command, looks like it's gone. So let's do nano minus w. Oh, of course, we added it outside of this environment, didn't we? So it's just uh, etc. Portage make. Or portage make.conf so what it tends to do is just keep all this other stuff down here actually is, is vim I prefer via or vim I'm just going to see if it's no it's not available so I'll have to install that so I'm going to put that cursor there just paste that in now this is why one of the things I don't like about Nano that looks like that's pasted incorrectly but what it is the the line sort of scrolls to the left whereas the other lines don't in the file so it's a bit off-putting so if I just press home and go to the beginning so you can see that these are all flags that are activated and if we go to the use flags we can see what these are so ACL for example is there that's access control libs so you probably don't want to deactivate most of these, I would have said. Just going to look across. I'm actually going to deactivate IPv6 because I don't use that. So I'm going to put a minus in front of that to deactivate it. Force it, deactivate it. Uh, just check the other ones. Yeah, there's a couple of others I'm going to add in here. One is going to be... I'm adding PPP, which is something to do with point-to-point -point protocol. I don't use that at all. It's more to do with modems, and I want to make sure that's deactivated. I think there's another one, but I can't think of it offhand. I'll, I'll probably do it when I come, you know, remember it. <laughs> but they'll do for now. So what I should do is Control X and save that, and rerun that emerge command to see if that has affected anything that's built into the system. Right, now this is not something I've done, or is it? Yeah, that's strange. So I've found this before. When you do that command to find out what use flags are active, and it tells you what's active, then you add it into the make.conf, it seems to behave differently. And what it's saying is that you can't have the PAM and static variables set at the same time. You can only have one or the other. So, um, it's probably best to have, it's it's up to you how you resolve this. You might need to do some research um, to find out which is the best uh, flag to have here. Um, if, if you're not sure, seek advice maybe. Um, this is to BusyBox. BusyBox might be something you use when you're in a rescue environment so you're probably not going to want to have PAM in that case but you would want to have static because you might not have the libraries available so I would say in this in my case for my reasoning that PAM is probably the one that I want to turn off so because we've got PAM activated globally and we've obviously got static activated globally um, that we want to turn off PAM. Uh, so let's... Just wondering why we've got static activated globally, actually. But then that's probably because... Uh, it's probably because we just added that in, isn't it? Oh, no, it's not there. So, yeah, I don't understand this, why that's not... It might be one that's forced on us. Uh, 
might be one that's necessary to make uh, BusyBox active. I don't know, but it's not something we've just added in with with that use command, uh, that use variable in the, in the make.conf. So what we want to do is turn off Pam, but just for BusyBox. So what I do with this is highlight the uh, package and the variable in question. And then what we do is we modify another file called package.use. Right, now it says it's a directory. There's two ways of doing this. Let's come out of this. If I go into etc portage or portage, yeah, you can see that there's a package.license, a package.use. You can put text files in these directories with the information that we're just about to enter. I've tried that and didn't find it very helpful because if you want to add in a flag that's across several packages but you don't want to add it in lo uh, globally in the make.conf, you've got to open up each of those individual files and locate that flag or edit that flag. Likewise, if you want to find out what packages have got a flag that's not in the make.config but it is set locally, you'd have to do a bit of a uh, bit of the dark arts, the Linux uh, bash prompt dark arts to go through every single file trying to look for that flag. So I've found that these aren't so helpful in, for me anyway. You might find that doing it that way is easier for you but I don't like them so what I should do is remove the package.use directory there's nothing in there and I'll also remove the license directory assuming there's, oh, there is something in there ok I'll leave that one for the moment so what I should do is rerun this nano command to create the package.use file ok that's changed now because I've edited it. So let's go back, re highlight this, paste that in here. So, what we do with this is you remove the version and the repository name, and you just put in the flag that you want to add or remove. So, at the moment, it's red, which shows it's what I want to add it. I don't want that, I want to remove it. So, I put a minus in front of it, and it goes to blue. So now I can save that. Control X, yes, press enter. Uh, while I'm here, I'll just look at that package license one because I don't want that. But I'll need to keep this license to prevent um, errors from occurring. Allow Linux firmware and other packages. All right, okay, so what I might do is just remove this anyway and just get that one error come up or one warning. So I'm going to do remove. So now if I rerun that update command, I should get the, uh, uh, what was it, UC lib, was it? Oh, BusyBox, yeah. BusyBox package will need to be updated. Oh, and I've also got a host of others that are going to be updated because of the IPv6 that I've deactivated. Um, there's not actually any warning about the license, so that might be a catch-all license that's not actually being used at the moment, but, but may have been in the future. But that's not a problem. Um, if there's anything we install that requires a license or a change to license, then Emerge will warn us now, and uh, we, can, we can make that change as needed. So... As before, you saw that we saw all the commands that are being run when the configure was being run, when the compile was being run, when the install was being run. And they just scroll off the screen and you can't really see what stage uh, Emerge is at. So what we can do is add on another switch called minus minus jobs equals, and we can specify how many parallel jobs we want to run at the same time. Now, I normally set this to the number of cores that are available, which is six, but also you've got to remember that the number of parallel compile commands is also set to six. So it could be the case that you've potentially got 36 parallel jobs running at the same time. 
which may slow the system down. But I think on balance, I've found that because certain packages at certain times may only have one or two uh, uh, compiles running, actually having jobs set to the number of cores is not such a bad thing. There, there may be situations where you run out of memory or you're getting close to running out of memory or you're starting to swap. Um, in that case, you may want to rethink, but we haven't got any big, really big packages installed at the moment. So I'm just going to set that to six. And what you'll all no also notice, when jobs is set to two or more, we don't see all the outputs, but what we do get is just a nice little status update of what packages are being installed. And it's a lot easier to see uh, how the build is going. So this bit looks the same. We can see all the packages that are being updated or rebuilt and why they're being rebuilt. And we get a summary saying that 13 are reinstalled and how big the downloads are. So just press enter there for yes. And now this is the big change. All we get is a status saying what packages are being emerged. So we're getting four in parallel being emerged at the same time here. And as this goes through, you'll see one of these will be installing and then you'll see another one kick off. Or you might find that all of these packages have got to be installed before uh, one package which is blocking any further merging can be done. But this is definitely a lot nicer to, to watch when you're watching, a, a, especially a big build uh, going on, rather than just, as I say, just seeing commands spewing off the screen all the time. You, you're never really sure what status or what state the, the build is at. This is much nicer to see. While that's running, I'll just show the um, if I SSH into this system again. Oh, spelt that IP address. Been pinging someone somewhere in the world. So it says here. Full description available use flags we found in the system so this is where it lies on the hard disk you can use less to, oh sorry it's got less isn't it yeah okay it looks like it's not there anymore oh right okay i know why because we're not in the true environment so let's add in uh, MNT Gen 2. There you go. So there are all the global use variables. So that should be pretty well up to date. So that's the first part of this use flag index. That's all this lot here. That's what that file should reflect. All the way down to there, all that lot is this far on the right. And it shows there an example of adjusting that as I've done. So they're, they're deactivating GTK and deactivating GNOME and they've activated Qt4.5 and so on. Yeah, it's it's. I've I've never used this, and I've I've I would have thought this would be extremely dangerous to use. So yeah, it does say it's discouraged. I, like I said, I've never used it, and I, I don't think I'd ever want to. It, it seems too dangerous to to use. Um, there's this new. This is quite recent. Last week, or so this has uh, appeared. Uh, accept license variable. I've decided not to use this and to set the license individually for every package that I've installed so I can keep uh, uh, sort of tabs on, on what licenses uh, 
there are that's installed for packages that, that are installing. So um, won't I won't be setting that in the make.conf, but obviously if you wish to just uh, you know set one of these, they're, they're basically more restrictive at the top and less restrictive at the bottom. Uh, so you can add them in as, as you see fit. There's a bit about system D which we're not going to be using. So the next bit we can do is the time zone. So I'll just wait for this um, update to finish, which shouldn't be more than a few minutes now. Don't think I think Python's probably the largest. Oh, there's two of them, yeah, version two and version three. They're probably the largest ones to. Uh, build it's already done three so it's just doing two so yeah it shouldn't be more than a few minutes
Okay, so that is now installed, um, or updated rather. And as you can see, the um, messages at the end of the uh, update, um, it was describing a config file that wasn't found, but it was saved the default one. Uh, now you can edit edit it by hand. I've never never needed to change anything now because it's not a, a tool that I directly use, BusyBox. And again, it's reminding us to do this emerge depth clean, which again may well fail because there's no world file, which is what it's looking for. But looks fit, yeah. There's no no nothing to clean any, anyway. <clears throat> It tends to be the most times that you need to depth clean is when you've uninstalled something. Occasionally when you've updated, but mostly when you've un you uninstall something. So let's carry on with the installation and change the time zone. So let's do this first bit and uh, it's pretty standard, similar to Linux from scratch. You need to find out what area of the world you're in and then what uh, location you're in. So, for example, I'm in Europe, so I've just done a list of the Europe directory under this zone info, and there's London there, so that's good enough for me, being in the UK. So that's that will actually be a file. So what I need to do is to copy this command in and put in your own location and zone as well. So not in Brussels, but I'm in London. So should really copy and paste just for accuracy. And just warning there about using the GMT ones because they're not what they seem to be. It says reconfigure the time zone data package which will update the etc local time file for us based on the etc time zone entry. So we just run this emerge command and see it's got this config command which runs configure against this package. And it says updating the local time to Europe London. Next we want to configure the locales, again this is based on the character set and the language that you use. So um, this is again similar to Linux from scratch, you just want to enable ones that are appropriate for your country. So what I normally do here is change the US ones to GB. and leave the others commented out. In fact, I normally delete them because they're just not necessary. And it is recommended in Gen 2 to have a UTF-8 uh, locale as well as your standard one. So that's why I've got two entries in there. So just control X to save and exit. Uh, it, oh, there's the warning about the uh, UTF-8 locale. And as you can see, they've got two each for the US and German uh, locales. So next you run this command locale gen, which will create the locales based on that uh, that uh, configuration we've just uh, made. And we can run the locale minus A command to see what locales are available. So those are the ones we've just created as a standard ENGB and then this one with the ISO 88591 and one with the UTF-8 and then these other ones will be created by the system I imagine. Once done it's now time to set the system wide locale settings again we use eselect for this so again if we run eselect you can see there's a locale option there So let's put that in and you can see what you can do with it. You can list, set and show it. So pretty standard. So list. So none are set at the moment because there's no little blue star next to any of them. So we need to select one of these. So I'm going to select that one there. So it's just E select locale set and then the number in square brackets again next to that line. So you select four and it says it's set in the language or lang variable to 
ENGB ISO 88591 and it tells me to run or to source etc profile to update the variable in your shell so let's do that so for now do echo lang there you go it does equal that uh, parameter it set it to and if we just go back to e select and do list again you can see there's a star next to the one we selected as well and in fact it's got a more comprehensive uh, set of commands here to do three commands to not loan only in uh, resource the profile but to update the environment variables and also to reset the um, prompt because we've lost the cheroot prefix so let's put that in and there you go so now we move on to configuring the kernel installing the sources so it's kind of strange that the kernel which is like the core of any Linux system is not a package that's installed or available by default in Gen 2 but it's not a problem because this is where we're going to install it now and this is basically how you install a new package in Gen 2 let me just go back to the home directory safer so we use the emerge command again ask because we want it to make sure we ask it asks us and then you've got the like the I can't remember what they call this now, but this is like a sort of category that the package that we're going to download, which is called Gen2 Sources, is located. You don't always need this part of it; just Gen2 Sources would uh, be enough. But there are some packages that have got duplicate names, so this acts like a, a namespace to make the package unique. So you notice that this time we've not used the verbose command and there's less information on the screen. So if I do know there and include the verbose command, which can be activated either by verbose or just by minus V. In the same way, the ask command just can be done by minus A. And you can, in fact, like most Linux commands, you can... Um, combine the two options into one switch so you can see the extra information we've, we've got here now is um, the repository that it's coming from the Gen 2 and we've also got the size of the file so there's a little bit more information and we've also got this um, extra line at the bottom confirming how many packages are being updated and new and so on rebuilt and so on and the size of the downloads and the bulk of that is obviously the kernel itself which is quite big so let's uh, do note that again I'm just going to add in that minus minus jobs just to keep the screen tidy because there will be a hell of a lot of uh, screen scrolling past because Gen 2 sources the, the Linux kernels massive in the terms of the number of files as well as its size so in fact I'll just change that to 6 ok so we'll get that running now and you can see just by us installing Gen 2 sources it's highlighted this in bright green so that shows that that package is going to be added to the world set and these ones in dark green are dependencies, they're not part of the world set. So at the end of this, if we view the world set, that world file, we'll, we'll see Gen2 sources in there. And it would also mean that if we remove Gen2 sources, these are packages that would appear in depth clean, ready for cleaning, because they're dependencies that are no longer required by any other package. And you can see that it says that the 
kernel source is installed into user source and it's actually a sim link pointing to the version directory so that means you can have several versions of the kernel installed on the system and you just use well you can use eselect it's, it's the recommended way you use eselect to reconfigure this um, sim link to point at the version of the kernel that you want to do want to deal with and as you can see it says there's two ways to configure and compile the kernel you can do it manually or you can use a tool called gen kernel I've only ever done this manually because I came from Linux from scratch which everything's done manually um, I've only used gen kernel to create a um, init ram uh, fs file for one system I've got which needs it so I won't go through that because I, I, I'm not confident to show you that but I will do the manual configuration it's not too onerous so it's it, and if you've if you yourself has have come from uh, watching my, my Linux from scratch videos then you'll see there's um, quite a few similarities in the manual configuration so it shouldn't be too much of a problem and as this uh, message at the, at the post install has come up there is a a general up upgrade guide for the kernel on the Gen 2 wiki if you wish to read that and get some more information. So those files have installed. If we actually go into user source and list the contents, you can see there's the sim link pointing at a version directory 4.19.44 and there is the actual directory where, where these Gen 2 sources have just been downloaded and extracted to. And if we look at eselect again, we've now got a kernel command, which, or option or module as they call it, which we didn't have previously. Yes, we did. Okay, so that was there, even though we didn't have the sources installed. Um, yeah, so we can now do kernel, and we can see that, again, we've got the usual list set and show commands. So if we do eselect kernel list, you can see there is only one kernel which is one we just downloaded and it's the active one so we can just straight away change to uh, the Linux directory which is where that sim link points to the current version and if we look in here you can see this is a pretty standard Linux kernel directory so although it doesn't say it here um, I always do a make MR proper or Mr. Proper just to make sure the sources are clean. Um, and it says here you can use PCI utils the same as we did with um, Linux from scratch to find out what hardware you've got in the system. So if we do LS PCI, it shouldn't work because the package is not there. So let's install that. So emerge PCI utils. I'm not going to use the prefix and minus AV and number of jobs. I'm going to set to six in case it needs any extra dependencies. So there's only one dependency, which is udev. And that's what they call a virtual. It's just like a, a don't know to describe it. It's not a package, a true package itself. It like enables something that already exists, if you like. And the actual PCI utils, that's tiny anyway. So let's get that installing. Okay, that's done. So now we can do LS PCI, and there we can see the hardware that's available within this uh, virtualized environment. And we could do minus V for a lot more detail, and we could do minus K to find out what kernel modules are in use, which is what we need to know really. There it is there, AHCI, Sound Intel 8x0. So these are 
useful things to know for when we're configuring the hardware in the kernel. So we've done, we're in the Linux kernel directory. As I say, they don't do, or they don't specify make MR proper or Mr. Proper as a function. Now it could be that they distribute the kernel sources already cleaned. We don't know, there's no mention of it. But I just do it out of habit anyway because of you know my past with Linux from scratch. It was always recommended. So they go into make menu config. Um, I would recommend, unless you've got a kernel that you can use from elsewhere, that you can trust, that you, you know would work, I would just go what we did with Linux from scratch, which is the make uh, def config, I think it was. And that creates a default. Although it's rather large and there's probably a lot of options in there that you don't need, it's it's a good base from which to work from. It's it's almost guaranteed to work first time. And so now let's go into make menu config. Okay, for some reason it's complaining that the screen's too small, even though I thought I'd made it big enough. Let's just... Oh yeah, it's changed. So let me just make this 80 columns, that's better. And try that again. I don't know why it complains that it's got to be 80 columns, because you can actually make this smaller while it's running, and it well, it works up to a point. So it's kind of funny. It can't just work straight away. Uh, so this is pretty similar to the one we saw in Linux from scratch. The only exception is it's been modified by Gen 2 and some extra things in there. I've never had to change anything there, so I wouldn't touch anything there at all. But what we can do is just go down and ensure they've got some things here they advise. Uh, a set. So let's check these things, make sure they've been set with the default config that we've used. So we've gone into device drivers, generic driver options, and we've got to find one that says maintainer dev tempfs, which is already preset. See, it's got the dashes next to the star, which means it's built in and it's been false built in by it's probably another option, if not the uh, kernel itself. It's a requirement. And then auto mount dev, tev, dev temp fs at dev. So that's the next option. That's already set as well. So we're all okay there. Then it says enable SCSI disk support. Well, SATA devices are basically SCSI devices lower down. So let's make sure that's set. So it's in dev drivers again, device drivers, SCSI device support, and SCSI this support is already set as well. So let's go back to the top again. Select necessary file systems. So file systems is one underneath. Second extended FS support. Um, we're not using it, but it's probably worth building that in. The same with X3. If you're using these things, um, if you're you know in the uh, Linux environment, it's possible that you're going to have other devices that may be formatted to these uh, different file systems. So it's worth having them in. The other is probably not worth worrying too much about, especially in this demo that we're going to do. Um, won't worry too much about the other ones. Uh, the DOS and FAT ones could be useful because uh, some things are formatted to those like USB sticks and so on. So that's probably worth having. CD-ROMs, DVD file systems, make sure that works. Yep, because we'll be reading a CD later on. Pseudo file systems. Proc file system support, you definitely want that and it's selected anyway. And then tempfs virtual memory is already pre-selected as well, so that's good. PPoE, I don't use this point-to-point -point stuff. You may well need it for your internet access or, or any other means. So 
let's go back and just check that uh, network device support which is down here PPP uh, I'll miss that, I'm not even sure where it is oh, I can't see that so maybe there's something else that needs to be in other oh, it is there so yeah I haven't got it enabled and I don't need it but obviously like I say if you need it then that's something you're going to have to activate SMP support, I believe this default already act activates that, but let's check it anyway. Press this to type. SMP is already set. If you've got hyper threading, you may want to set that somewhere down here. Um, I'll turn off this AMD because I've got an AMD chip. Uh, where is the hyper threading? Have I passed it? Yeah, I've passed it somewhere. Could be. I'll turn that AMD microcode off as well. Could be because we're on a generic processor. So what I'm going to do is select one that's more appropriate, which would be this Core 2 one for an Intel chip. somewhere else check it if you can search if you press forward slash no match is found maybe it's an option they've taken away then okay not to worry about it um, might want to tune this down maximum number of CPUs I believe that will change a little bit uh, Affect a little bit of memory, so let's put six on there, maximum six cores. Uh, so that's that. Let's go to the next bit, which is device drivers for the USB input. So, I'm not actually using any of that, but I can turn it off. Obviously, if you're using it, you will want to make sure it's activated. We've got USB keyboards and mice and so on, USB support. So, I'm just going to globally turn that all off not interested in that for this virtual environment then we've got some architecture specific kernel configuration looks like I've already jumped ahead a little bit there and oops so let's go back to the processor type and features machine check overheating reporting I'm not sure if this would be available within the virtual environment but you probably want to leave it anyway for uh, a real machine um, we haven't got yeah, the IA32 emulation because we, we don't want that. Is that in the previous menu? No, it's in this one. And we've already set the processor family, so we're all right there. Um, partition types in the block layer. Block layer. There it is there, halfway down. So there's all these different types. Um, yeah, I don't think we need any of this, but I'm not going to touch any of it uh, because we're not using GPT, but I'm just going to leave that as it is. But normally I think I have that all turned off. Uh, UEFI, not using that either, but obviously if you need it, you will need to make sure it's activated if you're following that. So presses type of features, EFI is down here somewhere. Yep, so I'm going to turn that off because I'm not using that. And firmware drivers as well, which is... Uh, there. 
Yeah, it looks like it's already turned off. Yeah, it's been uh, hidden because the EFI is turned off. So that should produce a good kernel. There's one other thing we need to do because we're in a virtual environment. We need to enable some other features. So if you get another tab up and type in Gen 2 guest additions and then click on this virtual box link there's some settings here to ensure that a set because we're in a guest environment now a bit funny because some of these don't appear until you've activated some uh, but they're in a funny order so for example I think this Vertio GPU driver doesn't appear to have activated some of the other options so we've got the keep wits about us here <laughs> so let's go to the bus options first PCI and it says we've got to make mark VGA VBE uh, and set that so that's the one at the bottom here so let's enable that next one's in device drivers and we want to look at serial ATA and parallel ATA drivers lib ATA so it's that one there which is activated if we go into it we've got to ensure AHCI SATA support is enabled which it is ATA SFF support for legacy IDA and PARTA so it's that one it's enabled ATA BMD A support yep that's activated and then Intel ESB ICH which is also already activated so that's good so we don't need that one we haven't got that hardware we don't need that one we would do if we're using that PIX3 driver but we're not we're using the ICH9 don't need that one either Okay, so now we've got to go to the network part, network device support, Ethernet driver support, which is down here. And right, well, we can get rid of a lot of these. Let's just go down and press no and down, no and down, all the way down. We can get rid of all of these. I'm not interested. It's just extra stuff to build. You can see this is ways you can uh, make your kernel a lot smaller. I may, I may even do a video on this because um, the default does add in a lot of stuff. And it's obviously for like a generic install, which is how we're using it effectively. But you can tune the kernel quite a lot and reduce it in size and therefore the compilation time. So let's find out where the Intel devices are again. There they are. So we want to do a yes on that one. And we've got to ensure the Pro 1000 gigabit Ethernet support is enabled so we can get rid of the other ones. So it's that one there we need to make sure is enabled. Get rid of the PCI Express ones, all the rest are gone. So that's the only one we need enabled for the virtual machine. Exit and exit again and let's look for input device support is the next part. press enter on the right window so I've got to make sure we've got a keyboard keyboards is selected and an AT keyboard that's okay and for the mice we want to make sure we've got a PS2 which we have so that's okay now we come to the graphics support which is a bit that's a bit dodgy uh, so just carry on further down graphic support so we need to make sure that direct rendering manager is checked which it is we need to go into that one to press enter and we need to make enable legacy FB dev which is already selected so that's okay now the next one this virtuo GPU driver that's not here at the moment so what I'm first going to do is get rid of this. We don't need the Intel graphics because we haven't got that. But let's go to the frame buffer devices, which is right down the bottom. Go into that. And we need support for frame buffer devices and then enable firmware EDID. 
So that's the first option and we need to enable that one. Come out and then go to the bottom of this list and up one and there's that simple frame buffer support which is this option here and select that exit that one and then if we go to the console display driver support and ensure that frame buffer, buffer console support is enabled which is forced on it is and the next one as well map the console to the primary display device so that's all of those graphics ones except for that virtuo driver so we need to just have a careful look down here to find out um, virtual right yes I remember where it is now it's in this section here in the device drivers let's go to the top again I'm sure there's something here about Vertio Scroll down quickly looking for Vertio. Vertio drivers, that's the one. So if we go into there and then do yes for the PCI drivers, yes for the balloon, and yes for the input driver, exit that, and then go back up to graphics support. And there, magically, we've now got the Vertio GPU driver that's appeared that wasn't there before. So just press yes for that. So that's now exactly what's been uh, set up in the Gen 2 book. So now we need to look at the sound card support. So come out of that, go to sound card. Again, this is not a big deal really because well it's it's by the by you know it's it's something additional um, and as I say you won't be able to hear anything anyway but we'll go into this uh, advanced Linux sound architecture which we've got PCI sound devices which are here and we want to make sure that everything's checked here except for that Intel once so and there's nothing checked at the moment so we just look for the Intel Sys NVIDIA AMD Ally AC97 controller, which is that one. So let's put that in and exit. And I'll just turn the HD audio off because that will prevent another error appearing in one of the packages when we install it. And finally, USB support. Well, I've already turned that off because I say I'm not using that. So that should be it. Exit, save the changes. Now if we go back to configuring, it'll tell us what to do, which is make and make install. So we'll do make, I'll do minus J. I'm going to use 12, so there's two jobs per processor because there is a point, I think, in the kernel configuration where it does get a bit slow. So let's time this. It shouldn't take more than I don't know, eight minutes or so. And leave that one running.
Okay, so that has finished building. We can run the next command in, which is to install the modules. And we'll just check that the boot partition is mounted, which it is still. It should be as well, because we checked that at the beginning. And we can do the make install command. Now, normally what I'll do next is run the uh, grub config command, but grub's not installed yet, um, but I'm sure that'll be the next little bit. So uh, there's an optional bit there for in building an init RAM FS, um, which I say you need gen kernel for, which is the only reason I've ever used it, not for, not for building the kernel. Kernel modules... Um, yeah, it might be worth reading if you're finding some of your hardware is not working and the firmware as well. Um, I don't think we need that. Um, although I don't think there's probably any harm in installing that anyway. Um, it's likely that you'll need some for wireless cards, um, some network cards and other devices like TV cards and so on need, need external firmware. So let's whiz that in. Just changes to AV and put the jobs on the back. So this is the first one where you can see it needs a license added to the package license. So similar thing to the use flags, just copy the information that's there. Now it's offering to add these to config files, but what I found, especially with the use files, it adds a loads of comments in and it can make the uh, package use file really big uh, most of it ends up as being comments which I've never found particularly useful um, so what I tend to do here is just edit the file myself uh, we haven't got fire so let's do nano uh, etc portage uh, package dot license spelt the American way. So just paste that in and then just remove the version number. So what this is saying that this package has got two licenses, it's got that one and it's got that one. That's probably because of the number of firmware files that are in there, there's probably several different well, at least two different licenses so if we rerun this command it shouldn't complain now because we've basically accepted the license so yes we would like to merge these Okay, so similar to the um, uh, BusyBox uh, package that we reloaded, this has got a config file that it's saved for editing. And um, as I remember, with this file, you can selectively um, decide which uh, firmware files you want installed and so on. So, as I don't believe we need any of them, um, I'm just going to leave that as it is, and it means they're all there. To be used if, if necessary but uh, I've just installed this just purely for information rather than anything else um, so let's move on to configuring the system so we've got to create an FS tab file in the same way that we needed to for 
uh, Linux from scratch. <clears throat> And it says a warning or important that the default is just a template, so we need to edit this. Um, and we need to put in basically, we need to associate what we had in our disk layout. So if I list the partitions on the disk we've got, just to remind us that we had dev SDA was the boot partition where the kernel now resides, if I, I can show you that. So that, they, these three files in that lost and found directory are on this partition at the moment. Uh, we've got swap, which we need to include in the uh, FS tab file. And lastly, we've got our root partition where everything else resides. Uh, so we want to do nano fs tab. So some examples here. So I'm just going to create create it from scratch. So we start off with dev sda three, which is the root. That gets mounted on the root, and the file type is x4. And like they've done here, we're going to have they got examples here yeah we're going to mount this with defaults and no a time so in fact I'll copy that in and I'll just get rid of those spaces and make it a tab just to easy make it easy to navigate so oh sorry that's the boot that is right Sorry, I should have copied it from this line here because that's the root there. So I quickly need to make some changes here. So I need to change that to a one, and that one should be no a time. So the next one I'll do is the now do the boot drive, the boot partition. Sorry, so that partition gets mounted at boot. It's an X4 and want defaults. In fact, I want uh, yeah for for the security I was saying about. I want to have no no auto here, so that it doesn't get mounted automatically. Then we want a swap. So the swap is on dev SDA2. There's no mount point for that one. And it's a swap type of file system. And the flag just SW for swap. And there's no boot or checking flags for that one. And last of all, we'll create a CD ROM one like they've got there as well. So I can just copy that one in as it is. Oops. So I just change these spaces for swap uh, for tabs. Let's move that over a bit. So that's got an auto file system type because it may be a Windows disk or it may be a Linux disk or something else that's on the CD. And the user means that any user with the right group permissions will be able to mount a CD-ROM drive. And that should be sufficient. So control X to save that. Yes. So host and domain information. So we've got to find a name for the machine. So we won't call it local host, let's call it Gen2. Save that. Now we need to do some network stuff. So this is for the loopback interface, I believe, the LO. So it wants a domain name there, so we can call it 
I don't know, kernotext.org for example, that might do it. Uh, there's something about NIST there, which don't need to bother about. So let's save that. And then we need to merge this package net IFRC to configure the network interface. So let's do that. So it's called net IFRC. Right, looks like it's already installed. I found this when I've uh, tested this Gen 2 this time that a lot of the stuff that's in the book is already installed now that never used to be. So they're obviously making it simpler and simpler to install Gen 2. So we don't need to reinstall that. There's no flags associated that need to be updated. So I'm not even going to bother with that. So we can reload this net file again and make some more configurations which is basically all to do with the network inter interface card so the first thing we need to let me just save this is remind ourselves of what the network interface card is called the NIC so we can do if config you can see that it's called ENP 0 s3 so we need that because we need to change this part here to that name so replace ETH 0 with the name of the network card. Then we need to supply um, a network IP address, static addressing. This is why I said this would be easy because the, the uh, Gen 2 setup, although it's got DC, DHCP, it involves installing more packages and I just think it's easier to use static. It's fewer packages to get involved with at this stage where you're trying to get a system working. So I'm going to set this to 224 Netmask is OK and the broadcast IP address is OK and the gateway is correct as well for my, my network. So that's configured. We'll save that. Yes. Now to activate the network interface, you've got to change directory into the init.d directory and we create a sim link from a file called net.lo to net. Dot and then the name of the network card which is that so whatever you've got here is what you paste down here and then we have to add that to the list of services that get started at, at uh, boot time so again change the ETH oops ETH0 to that interface name there so that that would become the command and normally I'd start a service if I've just added the uh, startup scripts but we don't want to do this because we're in a Cheroot environment and the network's already running so we won't start it now just wait till we reboot and it will start automatically And it says here how to modify the fact if you've got the ETH0 wrong or you've got the wrong interface uh, number. Like say, for example, you've got two interface card, uh, network interface cards and you pick the wrong one. Um, then it says there how to rename it to the correct one. So let's change the host file. So this is where we add in... Uh, network names so I'm gonna actually remove or comment out this one and certainly the IP6 one and just put them in fresh down here so because what this does this specifies the name of the computer with the domain name so I called it kernotex.org and then these are aliases, so an alias might be Gen2, for example. And then obviously localhost is another alias. And that's the loopback address, which means this machine. So that should be sufficient there. If 
So if I do ping Gen 2, that should work straight away, which it does. It knows straight away that this machine's called Gen 2 already. PCM CIA haven't got that. So let's now move on to set the root password. So this is before we set the root password of the minimal boot CD. And that was to allow us to SSH in because we didn't know what the root password was. But now we're setting the password for our live system, which is currently inside the Cheroot. So set that to whatever you want it to be. I'm going to set it to something simple just for demonstration. But obviously, if this is going to be a a real working system you'll want to set a decent password. Next we look at there's an rc.conf file for when the system boots. I've never had to change anything in here so you can read all the lovely comments and change anything but you don't need to unless you have any specific needs. Next we need to specify what key maps we're using. The only bit I change here is I change US to UK and obviously you'll need to change this to wherever uh, wherever you are or where, whatever key keyboard you're using. I don't change anything else here. I don't find the need to but you may need to, for example, add in a uh, fix here for the Euro keyboard. So I'll save that change. Next, the hardware clock file. Uh, if you're again this is similar to Linux from scratch it's, it's the same for every every Linux system really if you're running a system which only has Linux on it you want the hardware clock to be storing GMT or UTC time and then it's down to the scripts at boot time to compensate for the time zone that you're in if you're running a dual system i.e. a Windows system and Linux system on the same machine then you need to set this to local just so that the clock doesn't get misset because of uh, Windows which I believe stores the local time in the hardware clock rather than UTC so I'm going to leave that as UTC because this is just a Linux system next we go to installing tools so it's just a few basic stool, uh, tools that we install here before we actual boot uh, the first one is to install system logger so it's a good one to install uh, no, that's not the time in this merge minus a b equals six so you can see it's a new install it's in bright green to show that it's going to be added to the world uh, world set and in fact I've just realized there's a log rotate use option there which means that it would enable uh, the rotating of the logs which is probably a good thing to have so what I'm going to do is copy this and edit the package.use file and add that in and what I do here now is just add these in in alphabetical order just so they're easy to find so I get rid of the quotes get rid of the version and you can see it's gone red showing I want to activate that oh save that now if I rerun the emerge command for syscalog d. Now what I should really do here because it already exists is I should use a command called one shot which means don't add this to the world file. It doesn't matter because this file is or this package is already in the world set but out of habit you should use one shot unless you specifically know that you want to add the package into the world set and a shortcut for one shot is minus one. You see there's no difference there at all because it's in bright green because it's already in the world set. So what I normally do is add a one. So that one is the same as that one shot long option. 
and that'll just rebuild. Oh, um, I just noticed it hasn't taken on. Probably because we also need the new use key as well to get it to look at the uh, why is this not working what have I done wrong ah right okay I've tried to do <laughs> I still think I'm in Vim I'm going to have to install Vim I, what I've done is put a capital X in front there and as it's not a valid use variable uh, of, yeah, use flag, sorry, for sysklogd, it's just ignored it rather than warn me that there's a invalid flag there set. So I'll put that back, reinstall it, it should detect it this time. So yeah, that's better. It's it's bright green to show that it's changing. There's no minus to show that it's being taken away, therefore it's being added. Okay, so that's built. We can now add that to the service list. In fact, if we do RC update on its own, you can see these are all the services that will start and what level of start or shutdown they'll be activated. So these are all started at boot and these are default starts and so on. So this one's saying add sysklogd at the default start run level. So if we do that, it says it's added it. If we now do RC update on its own, you'll see sysklogd down here will be started at the default run level. And we can actually start that service now, if we so wish. Right, oh, okay, yeah, it's because we're in the true again, sysklogd is all running as a, a service in the real uh, environment cron daemon um again with linux from scratch i don't think i installed it in the end but i don't see there's any real point in installing it here though you may want to uh, if you're building a live or a real system it's quite handy having a cron uh, daemon about for various things to be done at certain uh, certain times File indexing, well, yeah, let's let's install that one again. It's not particularly important, but it it's just can show so have to show um, how we can add packages and activate some of the options. So you notice here, I've left in the one, the one shot, and that means it's not going to get added to the world set, and that's why this is in dark darker green. So that would mean that if I did a depth clean after this, it would tidy up mlocate because it's not something that needs to be kept around. So we need to add it to the world file to make sure it's kept. So we get rid of that one. And now it goes bright green. So it shows it will be added to the world set. Okay, some information there. Um, okay, it's saying that the database for a locate command is generated daily by a cron job. So maybe we should install cron just for that reason then. So let's put crony in there. It's the one they recommend. There's several others if you have favorites. So that'll mean that the locate will be built or rebuilt at certain times of the day. Okay, so we add this to the startup scripts and let's try and start it. May or may not start depending on whether there's one running already, I suppose. 
yeah, there's one running already, so... Uh, it says if dcron or fcron are used, an additional initialization command needs to be executed. Well, we're not using them, so we don't need to run that, but we can do cron tab minus E. And you can see it's empty. Uh, so we can do um, an update DB for mlocate, for example. There it is. So now we should be able to do locate, and for example, find things. I don't know. Um, let's find where GCC is. And there you go, there's everything with GCC in it. So that's working okay. Then remote access, um, obviously SSHD is part of the system. So all we need to do is add that. We will do this because we will need this until we get the GUI up and, and the browser. So we'll add that to the default run level. We won't start that because there's one running already. And then there's a bit about the ETC init tab and make some changes there for serial consoles but generally we won't need to do anything here. Um, what you can do for security is add an option, no, or sorry, not for security, for debugging, add an option called no clear which um, prevents the screen from clearing when you're booting. So what I'm going to do there, here is add that to all the terminals uh, just to make it a little bit easier in case we get problems when we boot and then obviously when that's running I'll, I'll delete them just for security purposes so that nobody can see any uh, start messages but it's not really a, a biggie really so I'll save that file system tools um, well if you're not using any of these then you don't need to install them unless you know you're going to e2fs progs is probably already there but we can check yes it is so there's no point in reinstalling that So there's some stuff there about installing a DHCP client. So if you are using DHCP, you'd need to go through all this. Um, especially if you're doing wireless stuff, that's quite important. The WPA supplicant have that installed and correctly configured. There is a separate document about uh, wireless, installing wireless. It can be a bit sticky. I hate wireless myself. I've always had problems with it, um, both using it and installing it. <laughs> Uh, but it is a necess necessity sometimes, so uh, it's there if you need to use it. So let's move on to configuring the bootloader. We're getting there near the end. So the default, it says here there's two we can choose from. In fact, there's several actually, but the main ones, Grub2 and Lilo. Uh, I haven't used Lilo since Grub became available because it seemed to be so primitive to me that I don't know if it's changed, but if you made a change to the kernel, then the way Lilo works, it, it relies on knowing the sector that the kernel's on. It seemed to be really, really, really ancient, but that's just my opinion. I don't know if it's still like that or not, um, but I prefer Grub and never liked Lilo. <laughs> so I'll be installing Grub. Uh, again, it's it's all about choices. Is what you prefer, what suits your situation. Don't have to follow this, but if you want to carry on with just this demo, following it through, then yeah, install Grub. So we need to merge this. So let's copy that. Oops, copy that, and we'll do jobs equals two again. Now. You'll notice there's a colon 2 here. This is what's called a slot, and that's because the original grub is still available in slot 1, so this forces using the new newer grub. Uh, 
and there's that colon 2 there to show that it's slot 2 and you can see this is installing a couple of other uh, programs uh, it's installing some EFI stuff even though we haven't got EFI and that's because this EFI uh, variable in the grub platforms or sorry the flag in the grub platforms variable is obviously set by default so in this situation I could turn that off because I'm not using EFI um, but I'll leave it there because you may be installing this on a real machine and uh, it's just something to know that you, you would need that if you're using EFI on a, on a modern machine so I'll leave that in and you can see that although we've specified oh no I haven't specified six jobs let me rerun that Yeah, although I've specified six jobs, it can only build two at a time because that would probably mean that, uh, for example, well, Grub must need EFI, or it needs, must need all of these, or one of these needs free type, and so it's worked out what it can build at that particular time and just calculates all the dependencies. You don't need to worry about them. You just say, I want this package. It goes and works out all the dependencies and just builds them in the correct order. It's a really clever bit of stuff. In fact, you can see, as I say, they've made some changes to the installation, the mineral installation CD that makes some of the stuff in the man, in the handbook redundant. So you can see here that they're saying if you've got EFI functionality or you want EFI functionality, you need to actually add EFI64 into the Grub platforms variable in make config. Well, obviously, that's now default because as I say it's already there we've not had to make any changes so they do seem to be making this uh, simpler and simpler to install Gen 2 which is not a bad thing
Look how it's all installed. There's some information there about Grub2. And it's saying if you are dual, dual booting that there's something called OS Prober for detecting other operating systems. You do need that if you're booting with Windows. And to install something called LibISO Burn if you want to create rescue media. But as I said, with Linux from scratch, to be quite honest, you know, with these live CDs, um, it's probably something that's not absolutely necessary. And if you've got RAID disks, then MDADM needs to be installed as well. So we've got a news item to read. So let's do a select news list. And OK, it's talking about this slot. As I say, there's two slots for Grub. So again, just read that in your own time. Uh, news read. And it's number nine. Yeah, so it's just what it's talking about. So the next thing, we're using a, a BIOS, we're not using UEFI, so it's a little bit simpler. We can just copy this command in. If you're installing on a physical disk, just double check the block device name of the hard disk. So in our situation, it is DevSDA. So we don't need to make any other changes, but obviously if you've got several disks, you want to make sure that that is absolutely correct. So here's the bit where now we've got grub installed, we can actually run the grub make config, which will create a, a config file. Um, this is a bit we, which was created by hand in Linux from scratch, but here we run the uh, make config tool and it will scan all the uh, kernels in the boot directory and create entries in the menu in the config file so that we'll be presented with them in the menu at boot time. So it's quite useful tool, it does a lot of work for you. So Lilo will miss that, skip over that. EFI boot manager, another way of booting, Sys Linux, another way of booting. So we're just about done. Rebooting the system, exit the true environment and unmount all mounted partitions. Then type in that one magical command that initiates the final true test reboot. So let's do exit. CD, then unmount all the virtual file systems we had mounted, then unmount the mount gen 2. This will fail because we've got boot. All oh, right, okay, the R is recursive, so it's, it's unmounted all the other mounted ones. So if we do DF minus H, we can see that there's nothing mounted under MNT gen 2 anymore. And now we can do reboot and we should see the virtual machine reboot. And there's our grub menu, so that proves uh, grub's working. Kernel's booting, looking good. There's all the startup scripts. That looks pretty good, we've got a prompt. So we can log in as the root, because that's the only user that's available. And there we have our red prompt showing that we logged in as the root user. The hash shows that we're also the super user as well. Nothing in the home directory. Let's look at the root directory. And there's all the files that were copied from the uh, stage 3 tarball. But obviously there's a little bit more on there now, because we've been installing packages. Um, let's move on to finalizing, see if there's anything here. Yeah, okay, so adding a user for daily use. So that's a good thing to do. Let's, let's add a user. So let's copy this command here and just modify it. Right, we can't paste it in because we're... Uh, on this virtual machine so let's do let's type it in user add minus m minus capital G users and 
wheel audio and we can add some of these other ones in as well so let's add in cd-rom to allow them to mount cd-roms floppy we've got no floppy disk games yeah let's let them play games uh, portage i don't include that i i want to ensure that only the root does all the um, administration work so i won't be adding that in uh, usb if we've got usb support i'll add him in anyway uh, and video to allow him to do video -y type stuff so minus s slash bin slash bash and i'll create a kernel text user Right, okay, we haven't got a games group yet because we've installed no games. This may happen with one or two of the other groups. No, they're all right. So I've now got a user called kernel text. Let's set the password with password. Oh, of course, can't copy and paste. And type in the password. Okay, so I'm going to come out of the root and log in as my new user. And there I am in green as well. And I can view the groups I'm in with groups, and there they are, the ones that I added in. <coughs> um, we can remove the stage tree tar files and the other files if we so wish that are in the roots just to tidy up. We may want to leave them there, it's up to you. And then basically it's where do I go from here? Just some other reading there. Get help from forums. There are mailing lists, has report bugs. Uh, if you want to learn about developing Gen 2 uh, and even improving the handbook. So that's that's it for the installation. And it's just, as I say, the next two main parts, the handbook, working with Gen 2 and working with Portage, are well worth a read to get to know how to uh, maintain the system uh, and configure it. Network configuration, that's probably the bit you want to do if you're having trouble with networking. It's quite quite advanced stuff up there. So I'll leave it at that point for, for this video. Um, I'm going to do one other video where I'll be installing some packages, but it's kind of, it's different from Linux from scratch in that more or less once you've installed a few packages, it's more or less the same. It's just a matter of, resolving conflicts or uh, fine-tuning things. Uh, so, yeah, I'll install some of the packages I've installed in Linux from scratch, like my intention is to do LibreOffice, uh, install the KDE environment, Plasma, um, maybe one or two other, maybe, yeah, perhaps do the game as well that I did before, Wesnoth, just to show that, yeah, they, they are the same packages uh, just installed slightly differently um, and as I say how, how to resolve conflicts how to get some dependencies installed and so on and just sort of general maintenance um, and also hopefully by leaving it another day um, we can see how to do like the updates to fetch in the updates to software that you've got pre-existing how to you know how they uh, how you sync up and how you uh, get the updates installed so thank you very much for watching um, and I'll see you on the next video. Goodbye.